<laughs> and one, and lift Two, off. And three. And lift off. And wow, that's like real, that's like having a real show with a real studio control we, booth. We the, have a, vert, a background. I feel like. I can't believe it. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the OneRing.net. Yes, that is the website forged by the fans for the fans of J.R.R. Tolkien and all of his legendary works of literature and, of course, the astounding Peter Jackson films and the other great video games and pop culture and rock and roll and all the other elements of fantasy culture. If you're here for Tolkien, that's what we're here to enjoy. 20th anniversary of the Fellowship of the Ring. We're at the cusp of that very day. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to introduce my producer and co-host who is literally with me in the same bloody room. We are all For the first time in many, many months, and coming we're up here. in sports, we're we here. have the latest scores from Golf and Ball, and of course, weather <laughs> yes, uh, that's right. at our new weather map uh, coming up weather, shortly. Weather, weather across the Misty Mountains, what can I say? It's cold, it's bloody damp. Let's get inside. <laughs> Let's get back inside. I've got the phone that Amazon hates. What? Um, at showing us the chat. So I'm, what happened? I'm still watching the chat with you guys. We're here, everybody, watching you on the YouTube chat, at least. My, you know, that's, that's Justin. My name is Clifford. Welcome aboard. Again, a special, very special show being hosted by Sideshow Show Collectibles. Collectibles. We're Ooh. at the secret headquarters of Sideshow mm. Collectibles. Release the collectible hounds. There is stuff in the room next to us that they haven't even announced yet. You can't see it. You can't, I can't see it. I can't show it to you. And, but no. they said that we could no. show you some stuff that no. is relevant to your interests for the 20th anniversary of Lord of the Rings. This is a huge, huge show, Cliff. Uh -huh. And I'm so excited. This is part one. We have a part two of the show, too, which has got even more special but goodies we, in store we, for you. We, we put <laughs> stacks on stacks on stacks of, of content because that's all we're here for, content, right? That, mm -hmm. that we're, we're just content yeah. creators, right? Yes, that's right. But TheWandering.net right. has been a website for over 20 years, bringing you all the latest news, bringing the crew the latest news of the show and the movies that they were working on that they didn't even know. And it's great to hear <laughs> so many stories, and I think we're going to get even more stories because later in the show, oh, yes. we have a very special guest. I feel like I don't even want to spoil the special guest. You can't spoil the special guest. Oh, the special the, guest they the don't special, know anything about. They don't, they don't, they don't know. know anything about. <clears throat> so the announced Can I give a hint? Guest, Can I give a hint? No, don't. Don't. M please? Don't, no. no. Don't. No? Don't. Mm, ah. Just a tiny hint. Okay. All right. The, the announced guest is we're joined by Royd Tolkien, ah. the great grandson of J.R.R. Tolkien. And he's here to talk about his earliest memories of Lord of the Rings watching that movie in theaters with us, with all of us fans, and of course his new book, which is out for the holiday season. There's a hole in my bucket. There's a hole in my bucket. The story of Mike Tolkien, which is Royd's younger brother, who uh, suffered from motor neuron disease. And when he left this earth, he left his older brother a magnificent bucket list of adventures and escapes and crazy, crazy stunts just for his brother to pull, to help raise awareness for motor neuron disease and to commemorate a life well lived. So it's a really beautiful and touching I mean, you, story. You guys beautiful, remember beautiful the, story. The, the ice bucket challenge? Oh yeah. That was for ALS and motor neuron disease. So yep. hit, Tolkien, Royd's brother, Mike Tolkien, mm -hmm. suffered from the ice bucket challenge disease. Uh, it's incredible. I'm looking at the chat room, guys. Uh, great to see you, Arne. Uh, great to see you, Ellen. Uh, we are not at, at Scum and Villainy. We're mm. at Sideshow. We're, we've stepped up. We're in Thousand Oaks. Moving on up. Secret headquarters is not so secret. Moving on up to a <laughs> deluxe apartment on the east side. <laughs> We're moving on up. I'm sorry, I'm gonna get docked for that music. But hey, I'm telling you, we're definitely having a wonderful experience because this is the sensation of being a, on a proper studio with proper people and staff. There's and people here. There's technology there's all here. around us. I and feel like I haven't smelled you in mm. a year and a half. Do you wanna know what, ladies and gentlemen? There's a reason why they call me Scratch and Sniff Cliff, all right? And this is- this I'm is, not Scratch, I'm this, not, This, no, this no, is what? where Justin's gonna find out, right? Oh, I haven't seen him in so long. My buddy, my co-host and my producer. Mm. And more importantly- Yeah, yeah. 
my friend. My friend, you know, and my Mel Long. Side by side. My Mel Long. With a friend. And now that I'm not sitting down, everybody can see how much of the ant draft I've been drinking while he was napping on the tree roots, taking a nap, wasn't paying attention, and I have this big old bowl of ant draft. Ah, uh, yes, and look what happened to me. Look, and so I wanna, look what happened to me. Yeah, there it is. So I want to give a big thank you to Stephen Colbert for scheduling his 20th anniversary show tomorrow night. Oh, yes. Thank you, Stephen, for not uh, bookending with our and competing with our broadcast time. <laughs> uh, so if you want to watch something special based on the Instagrams we've seen, uh, Elijah, Sean, Billy, and Dom are all in Funny. New York City right now for a, a very special 20th anniversary Stephen Colbert Late Show tomorrow. Tomorrow night. Tonight is all about us and you and the fans. Cliff, I want to ask you, what what was it like opening night? Because I hadn't read the book. I just came in cold. What was it like for you growing up with Lord of the Rings? Were you nervous walking into the theater? I was nervous walking into the theater in 1978 when Ralph Bakshi had his film in the multiplex. We're talking that's, about that's Peter when I was nervous. Jackson's oh, I'm dating real myself. Movie. I am seriously Not dating the cartoon, myself. The real movie. I can't even. If you chop down the tree and count the rings, you'd realize that I'm a little bit older than I look. <laughs> Just a little bit. But no, in, in December, in December 2000, right when um, I stepped out of the screening in Culver City because uh, New Line Cinema had invited many of the writers and editors from the OneRing.net to come and preview Fellowship before the big commercial release date. And so I got to see it at, on the Culver lot, uh, on the studio lot in one of their famous screening rooms uh, uh, that Mr. Selznick used all those years ago, Gone with the Wind, all that stuff. Um, I walked out into the fresh open air Oh, and looked at the sky and thought, maybe I'm a changed man now. Because Howard Shore's music was moving through my soul, was moving through me. It was the first time I'd ever seen the film. And I got so personally involved with it right away, very, very quickly. When I successively went to the theater over and over again that whole weekend to see other audiences experiencing it on the big screen for the first time, I was able to take myself out of my own head and out of my experience to pay attention to the, the laughter, the, the shock, the gasps, the, the little outbursts of surprise or acknowledgement from the audience while they were experiencing it all around me because I had already seen the early screening. And I'm telling you what, psychologically, that was the best place to be, was to kind of soak in everybody else's first reactions all weekend long. People were thrilled. I heard nothing but applause and laughter at all the right parts, at all the right moments. And at one, one screening at the end of Fellowship at Universal City Walk, one woman screening up and saying, that's it? WTF? <laughs> that, was, that was one person who did that too. Wow. That the, actually happened. I see you in the chat room, Jeannie and Sarah and Nigel. Great to see a lot of you. Hi, everybody. We haven't seen a lot of you in several months, so it's great to see everyone come together for the 20th anniversary. Now, we've got a lot to talk about today because we're here at Sideshow for a reason. Oh, we're going to show you some stuff. But before that, Cliff. What? I, I didn't know you brought this, but folks... If you think you're nervous about Amazon's show, let me tell you about Lord of the Rings fans 20 years ago, okay? <laughs> uh, oh. The first swag Ooh. that the OneRing.net ever made. Ready? Stress balls. Stress balls. The OneRing.net. It was the first thing we ever made was for the fans to have stress balls. We gave them away at the conventions. <laughs> we gave them away at Comic-Con. We gave them away at the Oscar party, which was a unique event. Can you see the cat? He, my cat got into a couple of little bo bits yeah. in there. He's having a good time with it, too. But we just had to squeeze our stress away because none of us, none of us knew what expected. Peter Jackson was doing. <laughs> we had no idea what this, this offbeat... Kiwi director who's completely outside the system of movie making that we understood where we were thinking about movie making on the scale of we were Spielberg of, or no no we were thinking of bad taste we were thinking well of, I mean that's a what, horror director that's what doing, we thought 
Comparatively, yes, that's I'm what I'm saying. You, yeah. We were so stressed. So <laughs> we, whatever yeah. we're emotions we're going through right now, uh, leading up to next September second, uh, is pales in comparison to realizing Tolkien when, on screen in, for the first in, time. In 1999, when people were asked who should be a, a director to come up to do Lord of the Rings movies, Peter Jackson was not ever the first name that anyone ever said. Ever. No. People would throw all their names around like, you know, Scorsese and, and Spielberg and, and other filmmakers. No one ever would thank Peter Jackson, who stepped up to plate and surprised all of us. And then it became a cultural touchstone with the release of that film. The skyrocketing sales of Tolkien's books at all the retail booksellers at the time when the film came out. Um, Robert, you it's had just, one of these? I can't tell in you the guys. Chat? Robert, you had one of these? I, it's so great to still have you as part of the community here. We haven't made these. I feel like we should make Amazon-themed versions of, of we this need stress balls, for, yeah, for, for Comic-Con and WonderCon next year. Um, there, There's a lot going on. So I mean, yeah, they're doing a second age show, and the only things we've ever seen is a first age image. And so <laughs> we're all like, huh? Huh? What's going on? So yeah, uh -huh. we, we need the stress balls. We're, we, we're all in this together, obviously. So we're going we're gonna to get through this well, one way or another. Well, we have a huge show oh my gosh. to show you. I have a huge and show to show you. Well, <laughs> look at him. Look at this. Look at this him. This guy and these guys are all coming together. Should we start with Frodo first? Yes. Oh my gosh, because he's so super cool. All and right, then we'll get these, this other guy on screen. All of these are currently available at Sideshow. We're going to lead up to the exclusive new pre-order that you guys have to see to believe. But this is... It's pronounced is... Mini Company series, right? Mini Co? Yeah? The Mini the mini Co. The dot Frodo, series. Yeah, the Frodo Mini Co. Uh, this is $34, I believe, right? That, yeah. That, that's what our notes are saying. Yeah, this is super, super, super these cute. These are fun little uh, highly stylized um, characters and this is just this is just fun this is just fun and it's it it, it, it it's made it what is it a vinyl it's PVC yeah this is a PVC vinyl he is so cool this little guy is going to be on a lot in a lot of people's stockings he is um, better than elf on a shelf so, see there it is Frodo mini co Frodo there it is and right on the bottom from this, iron studios no the uh, the guy's gonna sit on your desk and because if you did not ever get the Funko Pop, then you can have this guy. <laughs> because he's awesome, and he's got this ring that is causing him a lot of stress. Um, I want to ask about um, the light-up figures as well. Yeah. Because well, some, of, some, of the, some of the figures they have, literally, like the, the Balrog guy, he's another cool figure. These are all available on Sideshow.com, where they have them on sale uh, on the website. LED plug-in, can I please? Yes, thank Greetings you very much. Greetings from Ireland. Hello, Kathy, Cathal, Sweeney. Dude. Oh, we got a global audience. Dude, look at this guy. Wait till you see what we have in store for the rest of the show. But right now, we've got a light up. Is that a USB plug? It is. Oh, my goodness. Hey, and where's that little mini Gandalf this? that goes with him? Oh, the cat got him. The cat, of course. No, the cat no, no, no. This is the cute. It comes with look. the Gandalf? This comes with the Gandalf scale, and he's going to be right here to face oh off my gosh. against... A demon of the ancient world. I love that it lights up. Look at how cute this guy is. There's a little tiny Gandalf. Look at that. This Man. is really, really, really super cute. <laughs> because, you, you know, they gave us an opportunity to show off some of these cool things. And I'm like, yes, please, let's, we've got to do this. Leah says, do I love guy. the scale of that. This is like the perfect size. And honestly, because it lights up red, this would go great on a hearth. At Christmas time, it's a, just the right amount of light yeah. and fire. I like the little ambient, the ambient glow. <laughs> it's better than one of those uh, salt crystal lamps. You want a drag? You want a Balrog? Yeah. A Balrog crystal? This is beautiful. He's so cool, actually, and the fact that he comes with this extra mini Gandalf who's challenging him. This is so badass, really. It's this super is everyone cool. in the term says this looks awesome. Arne says Gandalf looks powerless. I mean, that's the whole point of the scene, right? Like, we don't know Gandalf's full power yet. Uh, and when he says, when he says, uh, you shall not pass, I mean, he's, uh, he meant it. Um, <laughs> But he, this is a great, great little design style. I love he this is. little. He is. Look at him. He's so badass. That <laughs> little Gandalf. He's really cool, actually. And he is not going to take any guff from the flame of Udun, which is actually the elvish word for hell. 
So whenever Gandalf is saying flame of Udun, he's actually saying flame of hell. Monica wants to know how much that is, Cliff. $96. And if they I'm not mistaken... They come both pieces, correct? Yes, they are a set. Yes, there are two pieces in a set. It's 96, this light up Balrog 2.0. And Sideshow has a, a limited time coupon. I'm looking at a 10% off coupon that's on this page right here. And because we're what, looking at it on <laughs> Flame iPhones, of USB, the YouTube chatter said you Flame can of USB. Buy with Apple Pay? That's, that's pretty good. That's super cool. Man, buy with Apple Pay is as it was life changing for me. The fact that I can just like look at my phone and it completes the purchase. Uh, I'm not, I'm going to regret the credit card bill at the end of the month. Um, whoa, this looks rad. Hold on, Seri hold seriously. on, hold on. Seriously, this Gandalf is so trippy. <laughs> this, I'm mean, excuse me, this tree beard. This, I meant to say this tree beard. This quick beam this got tree his beard tree beard wrong. It, it, with Marion Pippin and other various creatures on this walking, talking ent. And he is just so, so cool. Look at this guy. This I can't even... is, I love the, uh, the characters, <laughs> the, 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 the Merry and Pippin kind of feel very um, animated. Like, 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 uh, like a 70s it's, sketch come alive. This polyresin um, sculpture is 16 centimeters tall and it's bordering on Really, really, really funny, psychedelic. If you could zoom in and find the faces of Mary and Pippin, because they're in this state of utter, utter distress. <laughs> and I mean, Pippin is wildly pointing, you know, and, and saying, oh, yes, let's go this way. And poor Mary, a doc, Brandy Buck, is totally freaking out. Nobody told Mary that it was an e ticket ride. No one, oh, and I'm, I'm even dating myself with a Disney reference that old. But oh man, the, tree, light, the lighting made him look like he had a, a mustache, but no, look this, at, this look looks at the snails. Amazing. You've got the snails and the mushrooms, and you've, you've got, got snails on this thing. And on the back right here, there's this really cool worm dude. <laughs> or no, actually it's a baby bird. It's a baby bird coming out of a nest and squawking right out of the back behind Pippin. This is so funny. Can you see that? There's a little baby bird. Steven in the chat room baby says, bird. love, love, love the snails and the fungi growing this on him. This is so super cool. And all the, already the people on Twitter were blowing up uh, my Twitter feed and it, saying that they really had to have this tree beard guy. It feels very Bakshi, doesn't it? Like, it does, like the, in a way. The character stylings on this feel like Bakshi. But it's it's very much the Weta designs from uh, the New Line Cinema films. But still, it totally comes off with a that different... That is definitely a Weta tree beard, but But that it's is... like a 1970s, late 70s psychedelic version of, of this Weta design. Oh, yeah. I think it is the coolest. It is $105 on, on Sideshow.com. And these are, these are shipping now, so I think, I think uh, Sideshow ships... In time for Christmas, does it not? I'm looking at my producer here. Uh, I mean, they're they're cranking right now, uh, fulfilling all these things. But this this is amazing. All right. The website says ready to ship tomorrow, but I guess that that is if you're domestic within the lower 48 states. I'm sure you know. This is amazing. It Copy is the, it is the cool. I love that the ball rod is so cool. Also, by the way, it says and this guy's uh, so cool. Uh, copyright New Line Productions. And I just got to say, the fact that New Line is still making cool stuff from the movies we love. 20 um, years old. Yeah. 20 like, years old. and boom. 20 years old, and they're still making New Line figures. Amazon, I hope you're making merch. Actually, that... I think for the next few days, there's still a chance to make it for Christmas. Just for the next few days, for yes. Next, okay. But, yeah. Okay. The end of the, I think Friday is the last day for cut, shipping cutoff to make it for Christmas. Keeping in so. mind, we're broadcasting on Tuesday... Um, the four, the fourteenth of this week. Yeah, can you believe it? We're really live. I, we're really, really live. <laughs> it, it, you know what? We're going to make jokes about that later on in part two of the show. But it's still December fourteenth. Um, yeah, who's next? The Witch King of Angmar. Wait, wait. The this, more this, this guy, Lord. This, this guy has a little, little. Uh, it's insane. Whip. Is it? Is it? What's it technically called? Is it a mace? It, or it, I think there were like different words for this stuff, right? Um, if I'm not mistaken, it's not a mace. And I called it a morning star. Morning once, star. But if, if I'm, I think it's a flail. A I need flail. to look that up. There, there, there are medievalists out there, and correct me, but to get the <laughs> correct name of what this weapon is, it's not a morning star the, because the that isn't on a chain. The chat says it's a flail. Cliff. It's a flail. Oh, right, that's, so, that's, so what flail that's what I thought. According to the chat room, but okay, Leia says morning star. Who are we to trust? How? Who are we to trust? Is it's it not a, a flail? Mace. Is it a morning star? It's Whatever not a mace. it is, it's a Weta design. 
<laughs> and it's made by Sideshow. Uh, I love this guy. He's like this super stylized, very stylized Morgul Lord. Uh, is this the Witch his, King? This always confused me. Yeah. Is she fighting the Witch King? Yes. Is that the same Witch King that Gandalf fights at the top of Minas Tirith? Yes. Yeah, exactly. And breaks his staff in the film. Yeah, the Witch King shatters Gandalf's staff while, uh, and, and actually uh, both Pippin and Gandalf are thrown off of Shadowfax at that moment in the film. Huh. Yeah, yeah, and uh, um, uh, it's, it's a very different confrontation in the book. The way that Peter Jackson stages that scene in Return of the King is notably different from the way Tolkien wrote about it in the chapter Minas Tirith, uh, where they face off against each other right at the lowest level of Minas Tirith, at the entry to the city, where the front main gates uh, of the first circle have been shattered open by Grand. 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 Let me ask yes. you this. Are we going to see the source, the original inspiration for Grand in the Second Age? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. No, no, no. All that late Third Age Mordor stuff, I don't think we'll see that. The Second Age is going to be more about... Would you? Would, let me ask you this. Time compression, time expansion. Okay. Would you like to see the original Grand in the Second Age show? In no, in the Second Age show, I would like to see uh, what's his face, Anatar slash Sauron. I would like to see him going to Mount Doom and going to the Samath Naur, the cracks of Doom, and forging his One Ring. That's what I want to see, and maybe the establishment and the foundations of Barad-dûr. I'd like to see them start the building and construction of the Dark Tower of Mordor, Barad-dûr. That, that's what I think we should see. Follow-up question, are we going to see the human source of the Witch King of Angmar oh, yeah. in the Second Age? Oh yeah, now that'd be super, super cool to see who this guy was before he was corrupted by one of the Nine Rings. So yeah, he I'm is all corrupted about that. by one of the Nine Rings. Yep. My money I'm is all on, about that. My money is on Russell Crowe. Amazon. Ooh, this, okay, what? This is your Russell Crowe casting right here. This is it. This Morgul uh, Lord statue, this polyresin, is about seven inches high, 18 centimeters high, and that's because of this insane spiky crown, and it is $90. It, it says here on the website that it's only a limited edition of 500 pieces. That's what I just read right here. So check it out, kids, okay, on SciShow.com. Okay, Imran in the chat room wants, is helping to clarify. Mm. This is a flail yeah. because it has a flail. Sauron wields a morning star in the prologue of Lord of the Rings when he destroys Elendil. That is that is correct. Thank you. Yes, that is so correct. A Thank flail you. has a chain. Super granular. I love it when our audience help, <laughs> helps us get to the granular details. Bless you, Melon. A, 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 That's awesome. A, a flail That's awesome. has a chain and a morning star is a solid rod. I'll say that, yes. That's great, yeah. That's been explained thank to you, me more than once. Thank you to the chat room. You never let us down. And I can never retain anything in this brain of mine. Uh, Robert says Grand might be at Morgoth's throne if they follow Baron and Luthien. Okay, that might be cool. Uh, you know what, because the, the amount of flashbacks that they might give us oh my into gosh. the first age, they might be They've numerous. already shown us the first age. Yes, they have, exactly. And that's the main marketing image that we have seen. But look at this. I'm telling you, if we do get a main second age show with lots of flashbacks to the first age, I'm happy with that. Yep. I'm happy with that. That's great. Look at, just tell me what you think this is before I even open the box. It, I, what do you think this is? It just says Gandalf the Grey. Don't even know what this I is, I have huh? no idea what this could be. Um, it is, is, it, is it heavy? It's a one ounce silver coin. May I? May I? Oh, oh baby. Boy. Baby. Man, I think I Look see at that. the... Here, uh, here comes the close-up camera. I think I see these silver coins on like late-night Fox News this infomercials. Is, this is a one-ounce silver coin. I'm going to close it again because I like that sound. I love that sound. Oh, I love that sound. This is a beautiful one-ounce silver coin. Here is the little uh, information card. Would you read that for me, brother? While I show the audience at home this what is this thing looks like. This is a 2021 oh. Gandalf the Grey one ounce 999 fine silver coin uh, with a, a limited run of 3,000 pieces. It is really only 3,000 of these and it's gorgeousness. But even more impressive than the silver coin, this is an official New Zealand mint. It is? Oh, hell. Oh, look, it's Elizabeth II right on the back. That's for real. This is a real <laughs> silver coin. In other words, this is legal tender. This is real tender. Who's that? For, Who's for that? New Zealand. Who is that? 
Well, it's the Queen of England. There she is, ladies and gentlemen. It's the Queen of England right here. And Ian McKellen. Quite. Sir. Uh, sir. Nice say, sir Ian McKellen. Fabulous. I love it. I suppose uh, Sir Ian would not be so displeased at all with the joke that there were two queens of England on this coin. He would probably love that joke. Was the coin forged in Erebor or Moria? Oh, gosh, good question. Is the, is the chat asking me that? Yeah, the chat's asking you. This well, is, if it was Moria, it would be forged out of Mithril, but this I is am, 999 silver. You, you got to hold it in your hands. It's gorgeous. It's just, oh, the weight. Ooh, oh, that is heavy. It's really beautiful. This is really kind of cool. Oh, man, the detail. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if the camera can get the, 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 the detail on, on, on like the, the etching, the relief. Maybe the, the shine, look, like every part of it, every grass is, is, a, is etched. Uh, man, you can really see the details. So this is an official New Zealand mint legal tender. Uh, so you could go to New Zealand and buy a cup of coffee with your, uh, w with your silver coin. Not that you would, um, but, whoa, 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 whoa. What, what? We're going to go from HRH, we're going to go straight away from Her Royal Highness, <laughs> Queen Elizabeth. We're going to go straight to little Smeagol. Maybe he's having a golem day. I don't know. Do you think he's having a golem day? Is he a Sm this, this is not... What is that? This is our uh, really, really cool... And by the way, that Gandalf of uh, the Gary Gray won $109 for that silver coin. We forgot to mention it's that. pure silver. It was and pure silver, $109. From New Zealand. But the Gollum mask... Fifty nine ninety nine. This is an absolute super super detailed prop replica. You know, you know this what this is good for? Is so cool. It's um, Comic Cons are coming back next year. I promise you. We just went to two. I'm telling you, it's crazy. We went to San Diego Comic Con, which I hosted the panel. You hosted the panel at Los Angeles Comic Con. We did. And no doubt, no matter what variants of this thing are out there next year, Comic Cons are going to exist, and they're going to be big and uh, well attended, and cosplay is in demand. This is... This is wild, actually. This is ready for cosplay. Yeah, take a look. See, you simply pull it on right over your head. I'm not going to. You put it on right over your head. Please do. I know. I'm, I'm actually properly domed with my neighbor, Totoro. So you're the one who lacks a hat. Shall we? Shall we try no, it? No, we shouldn't. We shouldn't? Okay. We don't have to. Do uh-oh. There's, there's Chris Saint in the background screaming, do it. Are you going to do it? Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, he is going to put on the golem mask. <laughs> and you know what? Smeagol, Smeagol, my friend, how you feeling? <laughs> Funny, my precious, it had to come out. It had to come out. Well, you know what? That that could be the best fifty nine ninety nine dollars, Justin, that you've ever spent. <laughs> it's pretty convincing. It's not creepy at all. Not I'm wearing not this creepy on, at all. On Christmas morning. <laughs> the, the, this is what the pandemic did to me. That's funny. Now, oh my God. are we able to safely lift this guy? Oh. Appropriate way to lift him is from the base only, right? Oh my goodness. Wow. Oh my goodness. This is amazing. You oh, got it? It's quite heavy. Here we go, right behind you, sir. All right. Let here. We go, holy moly. Say the words, say the famous words, Justin. You must say the Sean Bean words. Say the words. They have a cave troll. <laughs> they have a cave troll. And here he is. The chat room beat me to it. Thank you, guys. You guys, that's insane. This is insane. This cave troll is the real, real, real deal. He's a one tenth scale. In other words, Obviously, because math is hard, if you were to uh, use some incredible uh, magnifying uh, magic spell to increase the size of this cave troll by 10, then he would be exactly life-size as he was attacking the fellowship in the chamber of Mazarbul. Wow, okay, wow, Cave Troll Deluxe. It is by Iron Studios, it is $730. This limited edition, is, is gorgeous. It's gorgeous and terrifying at the same time. I mean, wow. 
Look at all the dwarven bones. There's, I know, if we go down to the bottom here... There's an outrageous amount of dwarven I want to point bones. Out and we're, I'm talking real orthopedic accuracy. Incredible anatomic, uncanny accuracy of dwarf bones but down more here. Importantly, it's really creepy. I don't want to shout out Nerd wow. of the Rings. Matt at Nerd of the Rings pointed this out on Twitter. Uh, oh, hey Matt. Yeah, check that the, out. This is the double-bladed axe that Gimli retrieves from Moria. He does not have this double-bladed axe at the beginning of the Fellowship, mm. but he has it coming out of Khazad Doom. So he picks it up. So after the completion of the fight, he has the wherewithal to rearm himself with a better dwarven he weapon. He grabs the double-bladed axe uh, wow. from the deceased hand of. Either Balin or Ori. No, no, Balin is inside the tomb, inside oh, yeah. the sarcophagus. Or, and I don't think Ori it, had it, an axe. It, it, he, he had a, he was or, a scribe. Ori had been killed. No, that was Owen. You're talking about Owen. Uh, oh, no, I'm talking about... Um, Ori. Ori the scribe. Ori. Owen was killed by the Watcher in the water outside the West Gate of Moria. I need to get my dwarves Robert Hill in the chat room straight. says, one-tenth scale means heavy. Yes. It's kind of impressive how heavy this is. And it says the building materials are, um, what does it say? It is uh, hand-painted, all hand-painted. It's polystone. Polystone. This is heavy, and it's really gorgeous. Man, look at that. And you can see I love it. it. You it's can gorgeous. see a life-size cave troll at Scum and Villainy Cantina in Hollywood, What's courtesy that in of his mouth? Sideshow. What's that in his mouth? Well, it's his is that tongue. his tongue? Is that it's his, his tongue. What are you talking about? Wow, I just thought that was some kind of no, that's a tongue. evil jewelry or something that he was swallowing or something. But I'm telling you, that's phenomenal. Wow. This is this thing is this thing is amazing. Oh, you know what the weight is? Twenty three pounds. Well, twenty three pounds by itself. It's still just, it's well. I'm, oh. I haven't lost that much muscle. Like it's not that heavy then. You know, yeah, my muscles have atrophied during the coronavirus. I'm sure I was just. <laughs> You know, the, the heaviest thing I was lifting was board game tokens during the entire year of the pandemic. So that was, the, that was my heavy lifting. So, oh my gosh, this is fabulous. And thank you, Sideshow, for showing us this. Hold and on, all, wait, all these is great this true? Things, all Gondor? these great things. This double-bladed axe, which Gimli finds uh, in where they fight the cave troll, mm. the chat room says you can see this axe used in The Hobbit. Really? Wow, okay. Wait. Uh, can, can, can we get a fact check here? Can we get a number crunch from the chat room? So this do you're telling me this double-bladed axe that is means at that the Battle of Azanul Bazaar, or the Battle of the Five Armies, I'm sorry. The Battle of the Five Armies is what you're referring to. If, if that double-bladed dwarven axe is indeed at the Battle of the Five Armies, that means that there was historical consistency that some of... Thorin's company and remember, you know, Thorin was gone But other surviving members of his company that went with Balin to go to reclaim Moria after that whole escapade with Bilbo and the five armies battle that included Owen, Ori, and, and I think Dwalin. Dwalin was also there if I'm not mistaken. Was it Oin's? People in Terram are asking, is it Oin's? Uh, double-bladed axe. Mm. Um, no, I don't wow. No, I think he was a, he was a scribe. Uh, Owen, no, Owen. Uh, I'm confusing Owen with Ori yeah, again. What's I've got to stop you? doing that. Okay, whatever. Um, Owen uh, was an apothecary in the uh, Peter Jackson Hobbit films, and he had the, the ear horn because he was hard of hearing. That's right. Right. Okay, uh, I've got to just check my head at the door. Uh, uh, well, this isn't the biggest statue we're here to show you guys, okay? And Oof. this is, are you ready, are, are we is, ready to debut this? This is exactly Wait, what we, we, we show, need to do. Should, should we show the, should we show the, the, the Amazon thing? Wait, no, no, let's do, let's, let's do this. Do, let's do this first. Let's do the big one. We're going to do the big one. Ultimate edition. Uh, Hold, oh. I'm not going to touch it. We're not going to move it. We I'm not going to go anywhere near so it. It's so big. Um, it's, it's amazing. But the cameraman can handle there we go. The camera. Where's can... Howard Shore's music when you need it? Um, if I hummed a few bars, we would get ding by the copyright people. So, <laughs> this is this is literally the ultimate three foot six. The ultimate edition. They've turned Legolas into a three foot six figure, or I guess technically the legal term is one half size. One half scale. One half scale. Uh, Sarah in the chat room says, "I need that Legolas. I mean, we all we we, we all need Legolas. We need every Legolas." Uh, it, it, I'm telling you what, I'm I am. Oh, look at the I'm details. I'm seeing this is some, all cloth. This is all cloth. I'm and, seeing some details here that are 
you know, the details on the boots, the filigree on his elven boots. You, all you have to do is just, you know, lift the cloak and you can see the detail. Don't look under um, his cloak. Well, I mean, it's all about the footwear. Rude. You know, you want to tell, uh, ladies, if you want to tell where your man has been, look at his feet. Holy Everybody what? knows that. Is ladies, are you with me on that, ladies? Okay, it's all We're in the man's feet. Here? Yes, we are. So take a look. Um, the, the base is huge, huge with this massive uh, Lord of the Rings title card from the original opening of the film. Um, his braces, uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, these are the braces that came, um, uh, he may, I don't know if he had them from Lothlorien. Did they, guys, in the chat, remind us if these braces Let's... are changed after the Fellowship leaves uh, Galadriel's presence in Lothlorien? They might have changed. I look like a dwarf next and to it. This he was so given weird. this in the extended edition of Fellowship of the Ring. You definitely know that this is the bow, which is gifted to him by Kate Blanchett. By the lady, um, the 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 hair work and the braiding of his hair is theatrical, perfect. Every single spot is perfect. It's just nuts. And uh, do, does it tell you on the iPad how much this thing weighs? Uh, I mean, it's just so this thing wildly impressive. This thing is so impressive. Product size forty four pounds. Forty four pounds. Wow. Stay close. So wow. this wow. is this is a brand new, this is our ex big, huge debut. This half scale Legolas, it is, they're taking pre-orders right now. It's a 10% deposit. 10% deposit is $290. So you can guess, if you do the math, 200, 10%, uh, 90%, I, I forgot math. Anyway, $2,900. Twenty-nine oh four. Ten and arrows, and a qu the quiver has ten arrows. The detail on the arrows, if, if you're looking at it from the front, and, and maybe in that shot we're using right now, you can't even see where his right hand is, and you can't, it's true. But if you had the camera over here, you'd see he's reaching his hand just like this behind, there he is, there reaching is. in perfect symmetry, about to grab that arrow right there. It's just Sarah so in the perfect. chat room says it's honestly a little bit creepy, it's so good. It's, un uh, it's unbelievably realistic. Yeah, let's stay on this shot for a minute uh, while we so read some of the chat. And uh, the attention to detail is crazy insane. Thank you, Robert. Look at the texture of the fabric. And how about this? The, bro the, the long swords. The long knives. Excuse me, I need to make the right the weapons references. The long knives references. are included. These are the long knives, the two long knives, with the delicate, delicate engraving on the handles. And this scabbard, I, 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 I mean, not the scabbard, but this... Uh, uh, quiver, the quiver that is holding all the bows, uh, arrows. Well, if I knew what I was talking about, I would speak normally, like a normal human being. But I'll tell you, the quiver has more detail on it than I've ever, ever seen in any single shot of the film. I tell you, Katie right Perry here, is a this lucky quiver. woman. Uh, Cathol in the chat room really says, uh, they're taking my bank account to Isengard. <laughs> <laughs> it says that this is pre-order time, ladies and gentlemen. It is not going to ship until July of next year, 2022. Just in time for Comic-Con. July, it is right here. In between July and September, next year is when they will ship this baby. Um, it's all gorgeousness, all gorgeousness from the top down. That looks absolutely mental. Erica, you're absolutely correct. It is. Cliff is a tall it is. elf, and he, look how big this half scale. The, you, way the, the way the fabric shimmers, just the natural fabric shimmer and the choices of fabrics they used to go with the other materials in the sculpture is phenomenal. He's got it's, that look it's as just if a great he's combination. seen where they are taking the hobbits. He does have the look, the thousand yard stare of, of seeing the hobbits being taken to Isengard. It has. That's the, that's the look. Yeah. I, t I tell you, uh, uh, we need a little powder on his face. I think the studio lights are giving him a little sweat shine. Um, he's been running a long way. He's been running for he's three been running days. Running a long, long way. They've been running. Re <laughs> Remember the orcs say they they're out of maggoty bread for three stinking days. That means though, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli were running after them for three days. Oh bloody hell! Wow. So of course he's going to have a little bit of a shine. A little bit. This yes. is this is this is movie accurate. Is this the dirt of Rohan? Does it do, do, does this look like the the hills. The yeah, this looks like some of the rocks of Rohan right here. Yeah, this definitely looks rocky enough to be Ro. But Rohan was supposed to be lots and lots of endless grasslands. 
<laughs> lots of grasslands and uh, and but the way that Peter Jackson chose that location was a little bit more like tumbled glacier you know rocks that had been moved around by glaciers you know you could tell that those that were... light undershirt is amazing it sure is it really um, is awesome this whole thing is really so, impressive so Cliff uh, it's really beautiful what, what the is boots. your expert opinion Cliff Sarah wants to know next two months of rent or this Legolas um oh boy how about Housing is temporary. How about this? How about this Legolas? This is a prototype, by the way. Oh. Again, this is pre-orders. That. So this is a prototype. So that that sweat shine is because it's a prototype. It's one of one. There's only one. And can I get oh, a number? Mean, oh wow! So this is a one of a kind. This is a this one of a kind. In fact, don't touch your greasy fingers. On I ain't that touching another thing. Skin. It's wild. You can That's even see amazing. the vein, the, the the veins in his hand. It's it's just crazy. And um, you know what? He doesn't bite his fingernails the way Elijah Wood does. Hey, good going, Orlando. You didn't bite your nails. Hey, chat room, can I get a number crunch? How tall is Legolas? And is that <laughs> double three foot six? <laughs> <laughs> would that be what? That would be seven, seven feet. Fo seven that'd, foot that'd be seven two? feet. Seven foot two. So how tall is Legolas according to the canon of Middle Earth? And it's a half scale. It basically, is he taller than a halfling? I guess that's what I want to know. If this is a half scale, does that make him taller than a halfling? Well, remember Aragorn described to um, uh, uh, Carl Urban, to Eomer, that you know they would be small, only children to your eyes. That's right. And with Professor Tolkien telling us in the prologue of The Lord of the Rings, he tells us that you know they're in between, you know, two and a half to three and a half feet tall. And to, uh, to us, we would probably immediately look at hobbits and think they might be kids. Uh, yeah, Ro we might Robert make that in mistake. The chat room, uh, uh, talking to my producer here, Robert in the chat room wants a fan blowing on his hair so we can get the <laughs> beautiful Legolas <laughs> shot. Can we can can we get a fan? We going? want that the Beyonce, as, the, <laughs> the, Beyonce. <laughs> the Beyonce stage fan. That's what I want. Yes. He says tall yes. as Mary We have Pippen one. We have the Beyonce stage Street. fan. Yes, we have it. Okay, I thought so. <laughs> Uh, oh, Nerd so of the lovely. Ring says you guys look like children compared to that statue right now. We are children. Do you know how old this guy is? This is an old man. <laughs> old, That's old. Look, look at that. Look at that thousand yard stare. Where, the, where are they taking them? Do you, do you see them? What do your elf eyes see? What do your elf eyes see? Legolas, get them up. <laughs> <laughs> Give them a moment for pity's sake. Let's, let's By stay nightfall, the, these hills stay will be swarming the, stay with orcs. Stay, stay on the face. Like, let, let, I just let's love that, that dialogue. Again. I love that movie so much. Uh, wow. Can you believe it's 20 years that I've had that dialogue in my head? Legolas, get them up. And then in response, Sean Bean really bringing it home and saying, give them a moment. I mean, Sean Bean, of all people, Boromir, Boromir of all people saying mental health. Give them a moment for their mental health. And Aragorn is like, by nightfall, these hills will be swarming with orcs. I'm, not, I'm doing a very poor Vigo, but 20 years I've had that dialogue in my brain. You I know, just the love chat, it. The chat room I love is it. saying, uh, Sideshow, if you can make this size figure with Strider, it's sold. So uh, Ooh. that's the request. Ooh. that people, okay. The chat room wants okay. a Strider, and they want a Sauron. Of this size, oh. this detail, wow. this a, scope. A half-size Sauron would be way, way, way taller than this half-size Legolas. Oh my gosh, wild. That's a wild idea. I kind of like that. I kind of like that idea. Yeah, Look. so Dan, we're, 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 we're reading your mail. Give me Sauron for sure. I would say Legolas is a yardstick plus six inches tall. Whoa, hold on. Hold on. Shall we? Okay, guys, let's set this up. Um, at random... At random, we got this in the mail. Yep. We got this in the mail. I don't even know what it is yet. And uh, you haven't opened it. No, uh, I don't know what this is. This is an unboxing, a brand new unboxing. This is an uh, unboxing that is not, this is not Sideshow related. We got this in the mail this weekend. Um, unexpectedly, if you want to send anything to the show, uh, you can send it to Scum and Villainy Cantina. Uh, the one ring.net uh, gets mail there, but this was sent to your personal address, which means they have spies. Um, but mm -hmm. right the, here in my phone, the yes. card. Yes, that's right. If, if, if we look at the card here, this came from Middle Earth. 
somewhere in Chatsworth. I think the box said. You guys. This box came from this Chatsworth. This is the first official anything. From Amazon Prime from Video. Amazon yes. Prime billion dollar Lord of the Rings and as, series. As you can see right here, I am a, I'm about to undo this little... This uh, is real leather too. This is This not... little leather thing. I'm about to undo this and we're about to see... Okay, as you're doing that, I'm going to read this. It says Prime Video invites you... It's beautiful by the way. Real join... leather. You're interrupting me. Sorry. Prime Video invites you to... Keep going. Keep going. Invites us. To join us on this journey as we bring the lesser known corners of Tolkien's Arda to life. How about that? They didn't use the term Middle Earth. The little known corners of <laughs> Tolkien's Arda. Do you know what I have to say to that? Awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome, because we want to go to the furthest reaches this off the historic. map. This is historic. In the chat room, you're we right, go, this is historic. We want to go off yet. the map. Rich stories of the Second Age found deep within the pages of the Lord of the Rings and its appendices. Uh, the chat room is freaking out right now. This is real leather. That is abuse. It's abuse. That is abuse. <laughs> it's producer abuse, everybody. A whole oh, new category. No, this it's is producer abuse. It, 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 if it's your kink, I'm not judging. But no, it's not I was mine. Just, I was it just is kind of mine. I was kind of thinking of Paul Bettany in the in the the Da Vinci Code, you know? Oh, sorry. Oh, I, oh nice. I shouldn't have done that. Sorry. I, yeah. I'm a big fan of that Sarah, stuff. Anyways, Sa whatever. Sarah says, I'm, <laughs> I want to cry with excitement. Okay. Um, Steven says, I'm dying. Show us. Okay, uh, I'm um, opening Gondor this up. says, wow, 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 I'm wow, opening... wow. Oh. Alex says, it's like Bor Boromir looking at Narsil right now. Whoa. That's what it, yes. It's written in Elvish. I'm going to tip this up. I'm going to show everybody. I'm going to show everybody. It looks like it also may have been damaged in shipping a little bit. But look at this. This is in Elvish. Oh my. Gosh. Holy Toledo. Wait. Look at that. It's That's wood. wood. It's wood. That's uh, really gorgeous. I posted All wrapped a picture in of this on Instagram this weekend when we first got it. And according to Facebook and Instagram, this reads in Quenya, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. In beautiful, beautiful Tanguar letters that were created by. Feanor himself, and as I open up this box, wait, uh, wait, wait, wait! Does this mean we're gonna see Feanor? Maybe in flashbacks. Maybe we're gonna get like the story of the Silmarils and some Feanor story. I would hope right. so. I well, would hope it so. looks like FedEx was uh, not too kind no, with with the box, but let's look at keep... that. FedEx. This is supposed to like seal shut like this, but you know, everybody, slide it open. you're freaking out. I'm freaking out right now. <laughs> this is gorgeous. This is gorgeous. Ladies and gentlemen, even though this poor box has been mutilated by uh, the process of shipping, I promise you I'm going to be really gentle with this. Well, that's what old things, old second age things do. This is the best gift that anybody could ever get. And it's, if we look at the side, it is it is inscribed, etched in the Yep. In the wood, prime Burnt video. Right into the wood. This is the anniversary edition of The Lord of the Rings. It is the 50th anniversary one volume the edition. The Witch King of FedEx. You can keep that camera tight. The Witch King of FedEx. The Witch, has... the Witch King of FedEx. How about that? My, thank you, brother. Let's keep it for tight. For showing me that. This has a bookmark in it. You guys. Wait, how? That's a big book. Is that the trilogy? This that's is the, all three the entire books? trilogy in one beautiful, beautiful volume. The complete best selling classic, as it says. And it is filled with, uh, I'm sure, some. Are there some illustrations in here? Uh, no, but in the back, the bookmark has been placed right here at Appendix A. <gasps> and we know for sure and there's that the date. Amazon has licensed the appendix, uh, the appendices of the book. Wow, there's the date right there, right at Appendix A. And what, and what, what is it on the page? What, what, it is, it says, uh, Annals of the Kings and Rulers, and the bookmark itself has the launch date of the series, September 2nd, 2022. The bookmark is at the appendices, guys. Yep, the, the bookmark. bookmark is at the appendices. I, I open I it up what, and it's, it's been placed mean? right here at the appendices. So Wait, do you know does what? does this mean? That, that's what the, the show is that it, part of it, the book? It means the show is this part of the book. And Wait, show the top again. Show, like show, show how much of the... No, the top, 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 top. Oh, oh, there you go. So the, 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 the show starts 
at here. the appendices. <laughs> The chat room, there are so many exclamation marks in the chat room right now. You, do you know do what? Do you guys know what we're feeling? I think this is very clever. This is very, very, very clever because they're telling you, start here. They send you a book of the Lord of the Rings and they tell you, start here, right here. And this beautiful... Stay on that, mm, stay on that tight shot. The, it smells so beautiful. The leather smells so beautiful. And, and, and guys... So this is a cover by Alan Lee. Definitely this painting is by Alan Lee on the cover. And, and look at this. It says September 2022. Yep. Which means uh, this is locked in leather. This date is unchanging, unwavering. Uh, this is as official as it gets. Nothing's going to change. Nothing's going to stop the show. The train is a coming, and it's arriving September 2nd, 2022. And thank you, Matt, from Nerd of the Rings, by saying I should leave this gift with you so that you can read it by the time the show bloody premieres. i got to read some of these. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Matt, Nerd of the Rings. That was a good one. Mm, excellent. This is, this is super show beautiful. The, show this box again. Let's, uh, the, the, the show. Oh, I have to say I wish this box hadn't snapped in the back. The spine snapped from uh, the condition of it it's being delivered that age way. It's second-age wood. But it's so beautiful. This bought this ish, ladies and gentlemen. So let's stay, let, let's stay close up as, as I'm reading some of this. Um, it yeah. says, Can you we get guys are really like close Gondor, a... who has been lighting the beacons, and Rohan has finally answered. Yes. Um, Sarah says, okay, Amazon is doing it right so far. And on the inside... Do you know what this is? Do you know what they're trying to tell us? That that they're trying to stick to the books. They're trying to tell us this is not just a subliminal message hidden somewhere, like a couple of secret frames of film that somebody dropped into Fight Club. No, this is this is like legit. They're telling us we are going to the source. This is made of Merkwood. This, this is Merkwood. They're trying to tell us that they're you know starting with the appendices and. All the histories. The wood of Nimloth? Yeah. The fair. Man. All, all the histories and the, the characters and the... And do, we, do we crazy glue this? We could fix this. I, I gotta say, I'm gonna leave it exactly as it is for posterity. And if Watson's it, in the leather. I'm, I'm just loving this. I think this is super cool. This is a what, gorgeous What is the first... Can, can you read the first sentence of the appendices? Where, where does Amazon start? The first sentence? Seriously, not just the note from the author, but the real first appendix. Okay. The title is? The title is Appendix A, Annals of the Kings and Rulers. But the first The first part. sentence, the first sentence is it's card part one, the Numenorian Kings. So the show is going to be all about <laughs> the Numenorian, Numenorian kings. kings. Okay. Part one, section one, Numenor. The first sentence. And believe me, I'm going past the professor's notes. Yes. Just straight to the text. Feanor was the greatest of the Eldar in arts and lore, but also the proudest and most self-willed. Boom! We are going to get... Guess what? It's official. We're getting Feanor in a flashback sequence. We're getting Feanor! We're, We're getting Feanor! We're, We're getting, getting Feanor the guy, the guy in... I'm not spoiling anything for the series. Obviously, I'm just hypothesizing here. But if it's in the book, if it's, it's in the on book, the screen. it's going to be on the screen. Feanor is in the appendices. That means when they give us flashbacks, they might give us lots and lots of first age stuff that will build up the the bones of what the second age will have unfolding. They can give us as many first age he's flashbacks. He's mentioned in this book, it's which right means here. he's going to be in the show. If, it's if, all right if, here. If it's in this edition wow. of the book, it is in available to the show. It says he wrought the three jewels, the Silmarilli, and filled them with the radiance of the two trees, Telperion and Laurelin. That gave light to the land of the Tell Valar. Perrion, we, we've seen. We've seen them giving light to the land of the Valar. We, they, we, we've seen that's that. That's the second. That's the second sentence. Hold on. The third sentence mentions Morgoth. Whoa! We might get Morgoth in a flashback. The jewels were coveted by Morgoth, the enemy, who stole them and, after destroying the trees, took them to Middle-earth and guarded them in his great fortress of Thangorodrim. Do you know what? The opening, the opening seven minute 
prologue that Kate narrated, Blanchett narrated by Galadriel, narrated by Kate Blanchett in the other <gasps> other films twenty years ago, now be narrated by Morfid Clark. Galadriel, a first age opening prologue. That's you know what they don't have far to go. It's it's all here. Professor Tolkien gave them everything they need to set up the stories and the show right here in the book. Cliff, we've just received a Thank cease you. and desist. We're not supposed to show. <laughs> no, really? Okay, yeah, sure, I'm sure. But you know what? Thank you. Thank you, Amazon Studios, for this lovely, lovely book. Everybody's got it right here together. And for this lovely bookmark. And can't wait for more of this. This is amazing. This is really lovely. Thank you for the gift. And I, I, have, I, something I to to, the... have something to read over the holidays now. I feel I should read it, too. Yes, you should. Wait, hold on. They sent you one. Da, da, da. We got a second breakfast. He got one. I got one myself. So now no excuses. You have to read it. I have to read it. I, but I, I, wanted to, I wanted to find in the prologue. <laughs> so, so everyone funny. told me, like, the rumors, there's no way some of these rumors that we have um, could be real. And turns out, here in this book, which Amazon has the license to, Mm-hmm. Right in the prologue, in the first pages, they talk about Harfoots. Yes, they do talk about... Oh, my God! It's, all, it's, it's called Concerning Hobbits. You've read it before, haven't you? Well, if not, read it again, because they've licensed that, too, right? They have the license for that, too, don't they? They do not and do not understand or like machines more complicated than a forge bellows, a water mill, or a hand loom. Though they were skillful tools. Even in ancient days, they were, as a rule, shy of the big folk. Big and folk. now they avoid us with dismay and are becoming hard to find. They are quick of hearing and sharp eyed, and although and though they are inclined to be fat and do not hurry unnecessarily, they are nonetheless nimble and deft in their movements. Yes, but what about second breakfast? Oh mm. So Amazon is sending us a message that if you want to spend your holidays getting to know what the show is going to be about, read the appendices. Start, start here. At not at the Grey Havens. Start at Appendix A, the Annals of the Kings and Rulers, right Chapter here. One, the Numenorean Kings and Feanor. That's Feanor, part one. Feanor. And believe it or not, it's on page one thousand thirty-three, because this is a single volume edition. All of the page numbers are consecutive, all the way through Two Towers and Return of the King. And when you end up finishing the Return of the King, at the very end, where Samwise comes back to Rose Cotton, at, bag, at um, three Bagshot Row, there it is, where he says, he drew a deep breath. Well, I'm back, he said. That's on page 1031. Amazing. Oh. Guys, 1031. So there is a little locking mechanism. So on page 1033 is where you start your appendix journey. There's a locking mechanism on this. Yeah. You see that movement? That's really lovely. So I unlock it. I open it. Oh, and my box is perfect. Wow. I'm telling you what. It's just super cool. And, so, you know what? You know what? Kudos. Let's see what happens now. Let's see this what happens now. So, kudos to Amazon. Thank you so much for this yeah, surprise. Thank you. Nice surprise. Uh, thank you for your stewardship of Tolkien. And as you can see, we were nervous 20 years ago with our stress balls. Uh, and Do you know what the, more, the more things like this that show you care about this, hmm. yeah. the, 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 the less likely we need more stress balls. <laughs> yes, we wanna, we wanna thank you for your stewardship at the appropriate time when we've seen something of the TV show. But what we're trying to acknowledge definitely is that you're taking on the stewardship of this in a more serious way, perhaps. In a serious way. So yeah, so that's a good sign, that's a good thing. We'll see, we'll see what happens next. Um, I'm very encouraged by uh, all this. Uh, this is a beautiful gift, and there's no better place. My, my box is in better shape, which means no better I should not start. read it and hold on to this, and uh, and maybe. Uh, <laughs> boy, this is this is. I'm just. I'm, now, I'm flabbergasted. Now you can release stress pillows that fans can scream into. <laughs> the stress pillows you hold up and go. Guard that with my life. Yeah. Yes, I will guard this with my life. 
uh, the chat room. That's wild. It's been wonderful. This is just the first half of the show. Are you guys ready? So we we reached out. We have a mega show for you today. We have a mega show for you. you part got, two. This is great to have part one. Because Sideshow Collectibles is awesome, and Side the, show, the thank people you here so are so much awesome. For hosting. But uh, boy, do we have a treat for I, you! I, <laughs> I want some of this stuff. In fact, you know what, Cliff? Should we go? I want to surprise you, Cliff. Let's go shopping. Wait, are you ready? Yeah, Cliff? I'm gonna. Yeah. Um, the 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 two things that got the most comments on this show. Yes. While we were talking about it, was Treebeard. Yes. And what was the and and looks like and and this Balrog. Oh, yeah, and the light-up LED Balrog with his little mini Gandalf buddy. Yes, so, so cool. These two things, I was watching the chat. Let's see if we can get a close-up. These two figures uh, got the most comments. So you know what Saicho has said? We're giving these away. Oh, nice, really? We're no, gonna, we're, so cool. We're, 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 we're going to give these away. Um, we have gifts for the younglings. How so, cool. So, guys, these figures are going to be yours. We're going to give a couple of these away. Um, we're probably going to do, uh, follow us on social. We're probably going to do one of those like, uh, you know, enter to win things like, you know, glean or whatever it's called. Yeah, that's cool. So look for that link on our Twitters and our socials, uh, Facebook and stuff tomorrow. And uh, we'll figure out how to give these away. But shout out to Sideshow. Thank you so much for giving these. Uh, to the fans, we're going to give a couple of these away. Thank you, Sideshow. Uh, Monica says, what do I have to do? We're going to figure that out. Yeah, we're going to figure out how to give them away. I, I, th I think the easiest thing is that... I'll follow our Twitter feed. Just and follow and, and... We'll we'll send out a we'll tweet. We'll figure it out. I think, I think we'll there's a way where like, we can check if you follow us and then and then we choose a winner at random. I think there's like services. We'll yes. figure it out. So or we can do a, a Google number randomizer. We put all the entries into an Excel spreadsheet. So it'll go from 1 to X. And then we'll just hit Google random number generator. Bam. Um, it'll generate some random number. Why yeah, not? yeah, I want we both. We can do it ourselves. Julia wants both. Uh, Erovandi says dudes. Um, uh, uh, These are cool, though. These are really cool. The chat room says just does Justin get to keep the Gollum mask? I don't want the Gollum mask. I was no. just doing that for you guys. <laughs> Serious that away too. You forgot the little Gandalf. Gandalf goes with with the LED Balrog. Oh, that's right. And I'm gonna actually light him up. I'm gonna so put again, him here. Nigel in the chat room says he needs a Strider the size of this Legolas. Um, so huge shout out to Sideshow for debuting this one half scale Legolas figure. Boy, is it and cool! And huge shout out for hosting us. Uh, yeah. Oh, and we got our producer coming in. Um, Here's our little. What plug is this? For our what ball is rug. this? Sideshow right. producer. Oh my gosh! Hi. So I'm Alan. I'm here with Sideshow. Hi, Alan. I've been watching the show. <laughs> Justin looks so good in this mask. <laughs> I'm gonna bestow this upon him to keep. Yes. Oh my yes. That's good awesome. Job, thank you thank so you, much, sir. Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sideshow. Now he has to wear, he has to wear that mask on you, our next you, week's Torn Tuesday. No, He's got I, to wear you guys it. are gonna have to earn this wet mask wearing. You're gonna, you're, <laughs> like, like this is this is going to be a special treat. This is funny for special this is occasions. Funny. Come on, guys. This is funny. A golem mask. <laughs> Stress balls Seriously? and golem masks, and a light up LED Balrog, and. <laughs> At a wildly. Oh man! Legolas is made by Infinity Studios uh, and sold through Sideshow.com. How super cool is this? Look at these little dudes. I love these little dudes right here. They're so cute. You know what? Thank you guys for taking care of us. Um, should we forewarn the audience about part two of the show? All right. So what we did is we wanted to do everything live. So we hit up the the most important person we could think of to join us on this 20th anniversary of the release of Fellowship of the Ring someone, this week 20 someone years from ago. the Tolkien family uh, be Roy Tolkien himself and Roy Tolkien answered our call 
And we said, we're live at 5 p.m., we're live at 8 p.m. Eastern, and he's like, I'm in Wales, folks. That would be one in the morning. That, he's like, I'm an old man. <laughs> <laughs> he did make that joke. He makes some really great, really great self-deprecating jokes from Roy Tolkien in this lovely memoir while he's trying to memorialize his brother and do these really outrageous challenges, like, you know, getting people to dance with him in public, strangers he doesn't know, and tight, I mean, like, zip line jumping, wearing a leopard thong, oh, yeah. a leopard thong, <laughs> and a cowboy hat, and fuzzy handcuffs, and not much else. Really crazy stunts that he had to do for his brother. Beautiful book. But it's a beautiful book. We Mr. talked more about it in the conversation because, we did. you know, we did. he, 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 he talked, he, so he DM'd us last night and said, hey guys, 1 a.m. is a little late. Can we do it early? And we thought, you know what? Let's re let's record something in the morning. So this is a conversation that happened earlier today. Mm -hmm. So this is really as live as we could get it, respecting everyone's time zone. It was live earlier today, but now it's just for you guys. Enjoy this conversation with a special guest who is joining in visiting oh. his house, <laughs> visiting his house in Wales, in northern Wales. A wonderful, wonderful special guest joining Royd Tolkien. Should we tell them or just let them watch? Let's, t let's tell them. Folks, Royd Tolkien surprised us even. So to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Fellowship of the Ring in theaters, we will get to hear Roy Tolkien's first reactions when he saw the movie. And joining him on this special episode is everyone's favorite, Jed Brophy. Yeah. Jed Brophy himself, he is joining the show with Royd. They're together having a very Merry Christmas in Wales. And, and you're going to hear some great memories and stories right now. Thank you for being with us. Enjoy part two of the show. It's Torn Tuesday. What else can I say? This was a big one. Thanks for sticking with us for the long haul. I know that a lot of people in other time zones are staying up late, but it's worth it. It's Je worth it. Jed Brophy and Roy Tolkien this right Tolkien. now. This Tolkien conversation is so worth it. It's so lovely. So, it's so stay till the end. Thank you guys for thank being with guys. us. Thank you guys. Thank you, Sideshow. Thank you, Amazon. And stay tuned we'll for see. Roy Tolkien and Jed Bro. And he and I will see you very soon, live again next week. Bye. Welcome, both Jed Brophy and Roy Tolkien. Hello, guys. How are you doing? Welcome, Welcome. you all. All right. Hello from sunny what do you Wales. Mean, you all. There's only two of them there. <laughs> this is recorded. This is guy. Oh, sorry. The, sorry. The whole lot sorry. of people watching. Welcome to all of you watching this live. <laughs> We're yes, li live. It's it's not Memorex. It is def <laughs> definitely not Memorex. But yeah. hello. It's hello. definitely We're... Tuesday, December fourteenth. It is live. Oh, we just don't definitely... know what zip, what time zone, it live. There... It it is live in. <laughs> Where you know what coming coming to us all the way across the airwaves from a beautiful beautiful hidden away village in Wales we have yes. the extraordinary talents of uh, Jed Brophy multi hyphenate um, the guy that I had a little tiny crush on since Heavenly Creatures when I first oh, saw wow. him Mr wow. Jed Brophy he's the coolest dude and one of the greatest goblins whoever said the, the magical words took a little tumble. Um, off the, and, <laughs> off the, what about them? They're fresh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what about them? And then and then we have the ever, ever so handsome Roy Ooh. Tolkien. Can't, can't get enough. Do you know what? <laughs> Ladies, this show is for you. We brought you the special beefcake edition of The Lord of the Rings. Yeah, the <laughs> Here we go. Look at this. Look at this. <laughs> wow. he's, got, he's being stung by loads of bees. So there's loads of lumps and things. In <laughs> yeah. I've had lots uh, of past lockdown to work out. <laughs> so here, here we are, two decades later, and we just got the news today that the National Film Registry here in the United States has now accepted the Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring, into the National Film Archive. Wow. wow, that's brilliant. That's yes. yeah. yeah, just like there's there's moments like that where you have to stop and say, obviously, all those years ago, 21, 22 years ago, when the cameras started rolling, you would never have thought that we'd be here now. We, you could have never guessed. No, I, I, I was lucky enough to work with Peter on projects before The Lord of the Rings. And 
as a fan of the box growing up as a child, I, I had to say that I wasn't sure that it could be done. You know, I mean, you have to have faith when you're starting out on a project with the person at the top and with the production crew. But honestly, because I love the book so much, I wasn't a total believer. I was, I wanted to believe. I wanted to believe it would be as good as it was. But I don't think any of us thought it would be as good as it was. Mm. When I saw that first 20 minutes, we talked about the trailer earlier in the year, I think, um, when, the, when the trailer first came out. When I saw that first Nazgul chase scene coming on screen, I was completely blown away. I was, I became a believer overnight. I thought this is going to absolutely rock the world. But until then, we were just working hard. But yeah. that was the can footage you're talking about. That was shown in yeah. France at the Cannes yeah. Film Festival. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, long before the film came out, and it's one of those things where it could have been, it could have been an okay film that just kind of you know was all right, but it turned out to be this amazing blockbuster because. Of the attitude of all the people working on it, you know, everybody wanted it to be better than the better than the last thing they did, or better than it could be. And I think because the literature meant so much to so many people, not just to the fans, but also the people working on the film, I think everyone, every single person, went the extra distance to try and make it as good as it possibly could be, right down to the person making the coffee. Indeed. Oh, oh my gosh, the catering. When I went to visit you guys and to visit on the set on the day when. Theoden was being healed by Gandalf the White. And you had all these scenes inside the, the great hall of Medruseld. And yeah. I, I, had never, I had never seen a production like that on that scale where yeah. you know, there was a, a second unit and there was a third unit and all these things were going on all around, this crazy whirlwind. But everybody who I encountered at that time during principal photography were so intensely focused on yeah. getting the job done right and especially mr Dorif, brad Dorif didn't even break character when it right. was lunch break and yeah. i was sitting there in a little table watching watching all these wonderful people in rohirrim costumes go by and get you know a little tasty snack and and there was this burning fire around his head uh, brad yeah. Dorif's head was ablaze he looked like ghost rider it was really he was he was amazing. He was amazing. He was on fire. Yeah, I was his. I was his writing double. No, so, really. Yeah, the scene where he has to leave, he gets kicked out of Rohan, and he, you see him galloping away. That was me. And then I got to double for him in the scene that was deleted, actually, where Christopher Lee gets stabbed in the back and falls off the thing. And I remember Sir Christopher Lee said to me, he turned to me and said, "Don't be the act. Don't be the person who kills the legend." <laughs> oh. I had to yeah. And really. I, no pressure, but yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, wow. You had to deliver the fatal blow to Sir yeah. Christopher Lee? Oh no, yeah. don't even. Yeah. We shot from behind. I'm not sure why, I don't know why Brad, he couldn't be in the country for some reason. So they shot, it It was just a shot from behind where I'm about to stab him in the back. And yeah, we we're up on this big plinth. And I just remember thinking, yes, quite right. I don't want to be that person responsible for, you know. How how early in the process were you uh, on the project? Like, did did you go through an audition, or because you had worked with Peter, it was already uh, you you were in on the earliest days, costume uh, fittings well, and stuff? Yeah, I was actually emailed by Richard Taylor. I was in the UK, I'd been uh, touring a theatre show uh, to be told it was greenlit, and said that they wanted to cast me as some of these orc characters. Um, when I got back to New Zealand, I was then given an audition as a Rohan captain, but Liz Mullane said, oh, but you've already been cast. I didn't know, but apparently I had been. So yeah, those decisions had already been made in terms of who I was going to play. But I heard that they were going down to do some Black Rider sequences and, and kind of blagged my way into getting onto the horse department, becoming one of the 20 full-time trainers, literally by saying I could ride really well and then going out there and doing an audition on horseback. And, and the next thing I was there training horses for the next three months. So yeah, as early on as anyone really, um, didn't get to meet wow. a lot of those actors because the horse stuff we were doing was fairly intense in terms of the training. Um, but I do remember driving Liv Tyler to uh, a horse lesson. And one of my earliest jobs was driving Kate Blanchett to have her ears fitted. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so Peter asked me if I would go and pick her up from her house and drive her uh, down to have her elf ears put on. So, yeah. 
That's you're, amazing. You're, That's just amazing. These these little bits and stories are things that we would never yeah. know. We would never yeah. know these things. Uh, uh, this know, is great. It's great. Look, right. I am more than happy just sat here listening because this is gold. This is, isn't it? Hearing all this stuff. That it some is. Of the, I've heard a lot of little underground stories and little underground things that have happened. But all of this, there's there's something that you just remember now and again. It just comes to you. It's yeah. brilliant. I love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. So keep talking. I'm... No, no, no. Well, no, <laughs> Roy, you, you're, you're in the movies as well in both <laughs> trilogies. <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> right when, when did it when when did you come into the mix and get your shot to be uh in armor and stuff like that when was it like oh can i come to new zealand like did you ask did they offer how did that come about yeah it it was um so when i first found out about it and i heard um just on the rumors on the internet that peter jackson was directed lord of the rings i thought well the guy who did bad taste and brain dead that's odd. What an odd decision in New Zealand, a place that I've never been to, and and actually hadn't really kind of, you know, looked up. I hadn't. I didn't really know much about New Zealand. I just knew it was miles away. Um, so I kind of like heard that this was going on, and was excited that something finally was happening. Um, but what I wanted to do, I made an absolute decision, is not to look, not to look at anything before I sat down and watched the first film. I didn't want to have any preconceptions. I just wanted to sit there in the cinema and watch it. And so I, um, I just ignored everything that was going on. And when it was coming closer to the premiere, um, I knew that the family didn't have any involvement, but I just thought, you know what? I'd love to go to a premiere. I've never been to a premiere. This would be really cool. And I wonder if I could maybe get the chance to do this by... I don't know, somehow reaching out to New Line Cinema. Didn't know anyone by then. And so I, I kind of just like did a bit of research and sent an email uh, and it got through, on, on, landed on the desk of this wonderful woman, Tracy Laurie, who's unfortunately passed away. Um, and, and she just wrote back and was like, yeah, of course you can come to the, the premiere. How many tickets do you want? So I was like, really? Um, so I then like phoned up the rest of the family and just sort of said, who, who wants to go? I've got, I've got this connection with New Line and they've kind of like asked if I want any more tickets. So my brother, sister, you know, just a bunch of us ended up going to the premiere. And that was the first time I met anyone and the first time I saw anything. Um, and I mean, it was, it's, I live in Wales. This is, this is my house in Wales and it's, there's a garden outside. There's not much goes on here. So like going to a premiere was mind blowing. Um, I'd never done anything like that before. Um, and so it was incredible. Sitting down and watching it for the first time was mind blowing. And, and then I met, um, I met Peter and Fran and Philippa and other people and kind of like just got chatting to them um, and made a connection, made a bit of a friendship. And, and that continued to the next premiere with you know a few emails here and there and a bit of chatting and then I met um, Tracy Laurie and I met Marco Desky and other people from New Line at the premiere and I just thought oh they're just really nice people because you get this preconception of everyone um, and I just thought okay you know because I'd never met anyone from Hollywood I you know it, it was as far removed from me as anything and so you imagine how Hollywood people how you folk are you too um, but oh yes, yes, please, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I just everyone was dead normal, just lovely, and you know, like I, I was, I was really struck with how normal, in particular, Peter Fran and Philippa were. You know, again, I don't know what I expected, but these are these are a big deal. These are important people that are making these fantastic films. Yeah, and they're just dead normal. They were just like regular people that I would see in the village here. You know, just you know, no different. They just, you know, achieved this fantastic, potentially what we all thought was an unachievable, uh, unachievable feat. Mm. So that connection carried on. Yeah, I think I've heard this quote. I'm not sure who it was that Peter Fran and Philippa managed to cast amazing people who just happened to be also amazing actors. That yeah. that came from the very top. It came from people like Ian and Kate and Vigo especially kind of set the tone for the egalitarian way that the set was run. There was no superstars. There was no hierarchy in terms of actors being above themselves. 
it really felt like a family of people coming together mm. to make the best home video they could that just happened to be the best film of all time you know um there was that feeling that we were on this great adventure doing things that had never been done before no one had shot three films at once with four units going simultaneously no one had done that people thought they were crazy yeah. that it couldn't be done but kiwis like to be pushed and and, pe and kiwis like people to go it just can't be done we go okay well we'll, we'll do it then yeah we'll do it then <laughs> right uh, a question has come up uh in this in in, in this show and uh, over the years um i don't think we've ever asked you um seeing lord of the rings on the big screen as you just described for the first time did that give you a, a deeper connection to your great grandfather's work and your great grandfather himself did uh, was there like did the movies provide some sort of connection to the work and the man that y you didn't have previously yeah i mean i guess in a way um because up until then well pretty much up until then it had just been literature that we had been educated by um and and the, again I've, I've mentioned this before in various kind of interviews and stuff there was no pressure to fall in love with his books or to read his books you know it, it started when the hobbit was read to me roughly when i was about nine um and and i just enjoyed it like i enjoyed having all the other books read to me so there was no pressure to kind of you really must love this um, and then I, I sort of started reading it myself and Lord of the Rings kind of when I was about, I guess, 11, something like that, 11 or 12. And I just fell in love with them. But when it came to watching the film, I my main worry was um, replacing what I had in my imagination with what I saw on the screen. And I didn't want that replaced because I am a um, very visual reader. And so I can imagine quite clearly. And I had all these images and I mean, as well as the landscapes, the characters. And what I got was, um, it, it, I, it didn't feel like it replaced anything. It just felt like it made it a little bit more visual. So what was created um, was what I had in my mind anyway. Also right down to the casting. I thought the casting was like bang on perfect. Couldn't yeah. have been better. There wasn't anyone that I thought like was a little bit weak or in, in anything they did. Um, but how that made me feel about Tolkien was, yeah, I think it, it did make me in some way connect more. It's really odd because I talk about this and I sit here listening to Jed and I chat to other people about it. I forget I'm related because I'm just as much as a fan, you yeah. know, I'm like, you know, as geeking out as these little interesting stories about behind the scenes. So I kind of, I keep forgetting, um, and I think that's probably like the upbringing I had was, you know, not to milk the name or to, you know, or to play on it or anything. Um, just appreciate and be thankful for what you've got. So I, but I don't know, it's a, it's a difficult thing to think if I was um, any more of a connection to Tolkien from watching the films. I guess it made, well, I guess so, yeah, in some ways it did, yeah. I, I grew up reading the books too, and I grew up on a sheep farm. I I was Strider riding around on my horse. I grew up riding yeah, horses. Yeah, I, I, I was as well. Yeah. I in the fields in Wales. Yeah, and, I was, yeah. All the sheep were the Ashak Rooks or the filthy orcs, and I was, you know, going around chopping. And my dad was like, "What are you doing? It's supposed to be don't don't be messing with the sheep, mate. Just leave them alone." I'm like, "Why well, they're orcs? I'm chasing." Them. He said, "No, they're just sheep. Leave them alone." Um, <laughs> I grew up literally half an hour away from the mountain, Mount Narahui, um, that they use for Mount Doom and Mount Ruapehu. And in fact, I have a box brownie photo that I took in 1969 of Mount Ruapehu erupting. And I remember saying to my mother, "Is that Mount Doom erupting? Wow. Is that Mount Doom?" Wow. So, wow. Uh, my my uh, kind of my fandom for the books i i call myself the lucky kiwi i didn't ever think that i would be in a film a b a film of lord of the rings never thought it would happen so for me i'm a huge geek as well i'm just a huge geek that was lucky enough to be at the right place at the right time having had a relationship with peter and fran as filmmakers and you know johnny on the spot if they hadn't shot it in New Zealand, I probably wouldn't be in them. Now, this is this is interesting to me because nowadays, with the business of filmmaking being what it is, very high risk, uh, 
high reward type of business, I, I think we can confidently say that with in the post COVID world, so to speak, with the economy of filmmaking being what it is, nowadays they would never ever attempt to make three films in a row. The fact that New Line Cinema and Bob Shea and all those people with Mark Odesky and everybody, anybody who was around that decision-making process to say, yes, Fran, Peter, go ahead, take the money, make this movie. It would not happen today. It just wouldn't happen. And what we ended up with, a, a production that was going to go on for years and years and years and release a pattern, a commercial release film patterned one year after one year after another year. It would never happen today. It's just, it's kind of bizarre that it got made at all. It's something of, I, I, would, I would say it's one of the greatest acts of faith. Faith in a small little studio, faith in a director who had not cut his teeth on material that big, to be honest, right? And, and get some perspective, people. We are lucky, lucky to yeah. have any oh. Lord of the Rings movies at all, at all. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. We're pretty privileged, aren't we, really? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, as, as all of us played a role in different ways, but pretty much we're all, we can agree, we're all fans. Huge and, fans. And, and, and it's just, you, you hit the nail on the head there. We are so lucky to have got this. And, yeah. we can, and, and we can go back to it and watch it again and still get the same joy and feeling out of it. I, I've said this in, a, in an interview recently, but one of the things I think people forget is the is the genius of Andrew Lesney. Oh yeah, the way that he created <clears throat> stuff that hadn't been on screen before. The coloration of it, the the kind of dark colors that he got on the hues, the layer upon layer of plate shots, um, just the way that they shot stuff at sixty frames per second and got actors to talk fast. That when they played it in real time, the gowns of Gladriel were kind of swimming in space. Mm. Um, designer Nyla Dixon that the Nazgul we had seven layers of black that we were wearing plus a prosthetic hump and so at full gallop with that seven layers it created this kind of almost floating in space there was a lot of thought from a lot of people that went in to try to do justice to the illustrations the original illustrations of your great grandfather mm -hmm. but also the illustrations of John Howe and Alan Lee and all of the other illustrators from the books to try and match that magic on the screen there was no letting up on trying to push the boundaries. What Weta did in terms of trying to push the boundaries. I saw this great interview with um, Bernard Hill talking about how on the inside of his armor for Theoden was the whole history written in Rohirrim language that only he would see. The audience couldn't even see it, but it was important enough for Weta to put it there to kind of make him feel special. And that was, they didn't, there was no let up for even the background extras. Everybody was treated the same in terms of going for that extra detail. Mm -hmm. I'm, I love that stuff. Go ahead. I think it's because the literature, we we're all fans. I think it's because the literature meant so much to, to everyone that worked on the film as well. You know, they all wanted to make it as good as it possibly could be because the book was so loved. That, that was my feeling at the time anyway. When you talked about Andrew Lesney, like uh, when, you're, when you're performing on set, were there any tells? Did you get a sense that a genius was working his camera magic toward you? Like, what did it feel different when Andrew Lesney pointed the camera at you than other productions uh, that you've been working on? I think I think it was the connection between him and Peter. You know, they had this kind of almost second sight with each other, where Andrew he he got on with Peter so well he could almost second guess how Pete was going to shoot the scene. So definitely by the by the time he came to The Hobbit, that was evident. But because they worked so closely together and they often had amazing meetings about what they were going to do and the pre-thought that went into the scenes and how they were going to shoot them was evident. There was a kind of a calm, he was so calm and confident. There was never, nothing feel, felt rushed. Nothing felt like it was a problem. And he was coming up with things that hadn't been done before. You know, I talked to camera operators, just went, I've never been asked to do that. Um, you know, he always had the camera moving, like the camera was a character as well in the film. There was just an assurance that you you were working with someone who really knew that were doing what they were doing and could get the end result. I've I've told this story before about 
my son in the third film played Eldarion, Aragorn and Arwen's future son. And we turned up early, Peter wasn't there. Andrew knew that he was a five-year-old and he said, do you know what you're going to do? And he said, oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. And he said, well, what's going to happen is you're going to run into, you're going to run up here looking all cute. You're going to run into Vigo's arms. You're going to turn around and then you're going to do your acting face. You're going to do your acting face. You're going to think, mum, please don't go. Mum, please don't go. And then she's going to cry. And then the audience will cry. And um, he put him on the dolly and showed him how the camera would move in to capture that moment and where the close-up was going to be and got someone to stand there. So when Pete came in, he said, oh, hello, Sedman, do, do, do you know what you're going to do? He says, yes, I'm going to run up looking very cute. Vigo's going to pick me up in his arms and then I'm going to look at the camera and I will do my acting face. <laughs> and, then, and then my mother will cry and then the audience will cry. And it's exactly what happens on screen. Exactly <laughs> as, as Andrew <laughs> described it. And it was just the way that he dealt with a five-year-old, <clears throat> put it into layman's terms, and absolutely now that take one is what ends up on screen. That's take one. That's what we Really? Saying. That's yeah. take one? Yeah. Oh my God, that is such a great story. That is phenomenal. That's yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. So from, yeah. from both of your perspectives, again, this is the 20th anniversary of the release of Fellowship. Everything was on the line. We were all nervous. I don't know if we ever told you the first swag that the OneRing.net ever made were stress balls, were foam stress balls <laughs> <laughs> with our logo on it. That like that that's how nervous we were uh, then. So was it were you guys nervous? I, I guess both from from Roy from from a family perspective and and Jed from a performer's perspective. Like how what were the nerves like going into opening weekend? Like w was it like man? I I hope they got it right. Are you talking about this stress ball right wow. here? He's wow. Wow. Oh, yeah. Do you have one as well? No. Oh, that's cool. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> to be honest, I don't remember it being stressful. I just remember being incredibly excited. Yeah. We, we'd yeah, worked. Yeah. We worked so hard. You know, it was it was um it wasn't an easy shoot. They were long days. People were pretty tired and pretty wrung out by the time it came to it, but but the energy level was still really high. I think we knew by the time it came out. There'd been cast and crew screenings, remember, the cast and crew before before there were premieres. So we knew it was a bangingly good show. Um, yeah. I, I heard from many people, Shane Rangi, and of course from Sala Baker, and a lot, of the, a lot of the stunties who told us that the nighttime shoots for Helm's Deep oh. were just out of control, difficult. They were. They were. Uh, really, one trying time after another night after night after night and the bloody yeah. rain machines going all the time yeah yeah they were and you know people forget that they had to shoot it twice you know there was they shot it and then they shot it again what we call reshoots or, or pickups um right those people that were doing those night shoots they had changed them irrevocably you know they changed from being creatures of the daytime to vampires um, <laughs> very hard to sleep during the day and there was kind of a feeling that people were going a bit cray cray by the end of it um, just because of the lack of sleep sleep deprivation is a it's a it's a very it's a hard thing to get over mm. one of the great things we talked about Vigo before and what a great guy is he wouldn't leave the set until all the extras were wrapped he would hang around and go no we're all in this together and I think you know in terms of those stunties got each other through. They kind of the camaraderie that came out of Helm's Deep kind of lasted for the rest of the shoot. So they were they were trying times. They were. Wow. I can imagine. <laughs> Go ahead, Justin. Well, you know, to talk. I want to stay on the like the the release of uh, yeah. the opening night and the, and the release. Um, and and Roy, maybe you can and help us I, correct the record. Or maybe adjust the historical record because I think there's a lot of uh, fans that have used a single quote from a single interview for the last 20 years. How Christopher Tolkien wasn't a big fan of the of the thing, and and they and fan and a lot of people just apply that to the whole family. Like the family didn't like Lord of the Rings in the movies, but then you ended up being Return of the King, and then you you came back for the Hobbit. It, you know, as a you know, as a related family member, like you were, you were a fan of the books and and you were a fan of the movies. And and do you do you think the movies um, turned out so well for so many people that you know uh, they were encouraged to 
I don't know, you know, when when other studios came calling, whether it's Amazon or whatever, and said, sure, yeah, let, let, let's keep going. Like, not everybody in the family hated the movie, I guess is the question. Mm. No, I, I can't speak for other members of the family, but I, I don't recall any member of the family hating the movies, and any that I spoke to anyway. I, I understand um, from Christopher's perspective of what he might feel about the movies because he dedicated his whole life to his father's work. And um, you're gonna be extra protective of that. And, and of course, they, they, they were written as literary works rather than they weren't, it wasn't a script, you know? So there's, mm-hmm. there's a certain element of being very protective over that. Um, so I, I can completely understand any view that Christopher had, um, uh, you know, and it's kind of, it is justifiable that people shouldn't, you know, um, not understand where he's coming from. Yeah. Um, mm. I think the other members of the family, the younger generation, um, myself, I say younger, like 20 years ago, younger. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> excited by it because, um, you know, we more so grew up on films, watching films. Um, and, and we hadn't dedicated our lives um, to work on these fantastic, um, this, this world that, that he created. So um, we were thrilled with it. And, uh, you know, when I sat there, same as what Jed said, I was excited to see it. I wasn't, I was, the, maybe there was an element of nerves thinking, uh, can I swear on this, by the way? Yes, sure. Sure. Why not? Oh, Peter, please don't fuck it up. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, didn't know, I didn't know Peter then at that point. I was thinking, oh, you know, please, please, you know, take care. Take care of this. This is a, a precious thing that you're using and you're working with. And coming out of that cinema, myself and the rest of the family that had been there, we were all blown away by it. And we were thrilled. And the after party, we... Um, we just hung out with everyone that was there and, and, and gushed about how much we enjoyed the films. I remember seeing um, Billy, Dominic, Elijah and Orlando running around the after party, ah! like having a great time, like really excited and just kind of buzzing. And I was thinking, yeah, you're damn right you should be. You know, what you guys did, you created something amazing here. Um, so yeah, I think I, I understand uh, from where Christopher came from with his view on certain things. Um, um, but uh, I, yeah, I, I loved it. I'm, I'm trying to be careful about what I say. <laughs> <laughs> As this is live, you know, I've got to be very careful. Yeah, yeah. Anything can watch well, what happens. Like, well, spe- hold on. Let's let's just consider for a quick second that back in the late 1950s, early yeah. 1960s, mm-hmm. um, uh, Forrest Ackerman, who was the publisher and creator of Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine, had brought a screenplay through a friend of his to Professor Tolkien, and it was terrible. It was a terrible mess. Professor Tolkien was all over that all over that screenplay saying, please do not turn my story into something like this. But the conversation at the time was, you know, should he make the sale? Professor Tolkien had kids to put through school. He wasn't making the largest amount of money working at Oxford. And so the opportunity after wildly successful book sales, the opportunity was in front of him. And oh my gosh, that screenplay was such ugliness. And it was something that Christopher was aware of, I'm sure, very much at the time. Then, in 1978, 79, United Artists bungles, you know, the attempt to have Ralph Bakshi make a two-part film. Didn't work out, wasn't commercially successful. Um, it's still critically held in a, a state of never-ending nostalgia by most of us fans. But still, nobody had really approached making a motion picture of the Lord of the Rings trilogy at all within the scope of what it could have been. So no wonder 
that yeah. when, when Christopher Tolkien was interviewed by that French newspaper at the time, no wonder, I'm not surprised at all that Christopher yeah. took a, a rather protective tone of the yeah. legacy of his father's work. Course, and and yeah. if, if you look at how many bad films have been made from good books too over the years, yeah, that, you know, there's a legacy of appalling movies that have been come from amazing bits of literature. Um, there have been some great adapters, but there's been some appalling ones as well. Uh, what do you keep in? What do you leave out? And that, you know, mm -hmm. when I talked right at the beginning about my fear as a fan was, I love every bit of it. What? what how do you leave? Yeah. How do you leave Tom Bombadil? out of the story. I mean, I, I'm still shocked. <laughs> 20 years later, I'm still in shock that Tom Bombadil is not in the story. Um, because for me, he's such an important character in terms of the magic of reading that book as a young man. Yeah, um, well, so speaking of Christopher and, 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 and J.R. Tolkien, uh, you know, we, we asked you, did the movies bring you closer to, to your great-grandfather? But you spent the pandemic, Royd, writing your own book um do you have a new appreciation for you know the christopher and jrr's uh work with the pen yeah he, well yes but my book isn't it didn't take as much as my uh, over as much as my life uh, as it did for tolkien christopher to write i mean but I, I did absolutely have more of an appreciation of how difficult it is to write a book. I was just writing, in effect, a memoir of what I went through with my life. And to give anyone that doesn't know a little bit of background is um, my brother, unfortunately, got motor neuron disease, which over in America is ALS, um, which is a terrible disease that um, affects the neurons that fire signals to the arms and legs and they slowly stop working. And also it can then go on to affect breathing, um, swallowing, blinking, everything. It affects all your um, motor muscles. Um, and the unfortunate thing with motor neuron disease, uh, there's no cure. Um, everyone who gets it unfortunately passes away. And it can be anything from a very severe attack within the year to up to about on average three to four years. Um, um, my brother ended up living for about four and a half, five years. But, um, you know, as, as deeply upsetting as that is, um, it taught me, it gave me a whole new perspective on life and, and being his carer, which I ended up doing for him, um, was, was a joy and it gave me a, an appreciation of life and an understanding of him and appreciation of him and um, connection to family and friends and um, the, the joy of life no matter how desperate the situation so um, what happened with Mike was um, prior to his illness he was super adrenaline junkie like a real go-getter semi-pro paintballer into snowboarding weightboarding or everything you can imagine adventure-wise he was into completely opposite to me I prefer you know like making a really tacky Christmas tree and uh and gardening and you know just kind of like yeah things like that I just never want to do a bungee jump or that kind of crazy stuff um so anyway um as Mike's illness progresses he starts thinking about the things that he's missed out on in his life that he always thought he would get to and he realized very quickly that with that condition, as it progressed, he couldn't do those things. So he started writing his bucket list um, and he wrote it for me to do on his behalf when he passed away. And so that list that he created of 50 things was uh, given to his partner, Laura, and she was the custodian of this list. And it was my job to go out there and, and tick off one at a time all the things on the list. And I didn't know what the contents were. So... I was scared with what this list would bring me, and uh, it was a, a, a challenge. Um, so the book is, um, it was actually, so what I wanted to do was Mike, prior to the Mike's illness and me becoming a carer for Mike, um, I, was, I was getting into film production. I'd done a couple of films and I was developing more. And then this, this happened and it changed my entire perspective and, and the route of life. And I ended up being a carer, but then, uh, Mike's instruction was 
you make films, make a film out of this. And if you're ever going to use the family name for anything, then use it for this, because this will help promote motor neuron disease, help get it out there, help inspire people, remind them how important life is and family and friends and love. Um, and so um, I went out eventually when I eventually raised the money, um, went out and shot the documentary and um, Amazon, of all people, approached me uh, during just before lockdown started to write a book version. A, a few publishers approached me and um, um, Amazon ha gave me enough free reign to kind of do what I wanted to do. And I spent lockdown last year writing this book. <laughs> How absolutely beautiful this book is. Oh my gosh, I cannot tell you guys. And well, maybe I have. You know, Roy, our audience is very much aware how, how, about this beautiful book. It is extraordinary how, yeah, how personal you get. You get really, really, really personal about the most beautiful, beautiful details of your childhood. And while I know that Jed was raised with sheep, you were raised with donkey, with donkeys. Yes. Well, I, yeah, we did have a couple of donkeys, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yes, did you did. Holding, so yeah, we had a, and we had some sheep. It was actually a farmer. I was saying this the other day. Farmer Gerald had sheep in our fields, and I would help him with those sheep. But yeah, it, it was. It's been a journey. This, but this is, you know, this this was me digging into the depths of my memory and going to places that I hadn't been to before. Um, and um, and it was very difficult, but on a on a the difficulty on this is on a completely different level to the difficulty that Tolkien went through in creating what he created and dedicating his life as well as Christopher's to. Yeah. I I I'm amazed with how he went there and how he he did what he did. When I was blood, sweat, and tears getting this book out. Um, but yeah, it's done. It's called There's a Hole in My Bucket, A Journey of Two Brothers. And uh, I'm, I'm super proud of it, but I'm proud of it because, you know, it's, it's really a book about how you can achieve these things, how you can put one foot in front of the other after such devastating loss. But also it's a way of people getting to know Mike, who is this cute little kid here. <laughs> our school photo in St David's Primary School in like literally a mile down the road from where I'm still living now and that's me that's me and him in school but yeah it's a um, remarkable it's a very powerful powerful tribute and um Roy I can't thank you enough for writing it I can't thank you enough for making it so easy to digest and it's so quickly quickly consumable and readable the way you've written it, it's so accessible, really accessible. Your work with Drew, who was your cameraman doing a lot of filming with you, doing these wild stunts. Um, and yeah. some, of this, some of this adventure that you were being taken on around the world and back, an unexpected adventure to say yeah. the least, but you were sharing the most intimate memories of your brother and it's so, it's still so accessible, even though you've made it very personal at the same time. And that is to your uh, to your great success with this book. It's really phenomenal. And um, I've been Ever reading. Go ahead, Justin. Go ahead, please. Well, I was going to remind everybody at home. Uh, ALS uh, is is what the ice bucket challenge was all about. You know, um, that's a very big reminder for people in popular culture. Because people remember the ice bucket challenge right away, and that was to raise awareness for motor neuron disease. Yes. And yes. you know why it was iced water thrown over you? Mm. Uh, it mimics the effects of motor neuron disease very temporarily. When you get that fro that freezing like shock of like, oh, that's what it's like when you lose all control. And so that's how it was created to have that same momentary feeling of of ALS um, and Mike actually wanted to when this was happening uh, Mike was like we're going to do that and at this point in his life he was on a breathing assist machine in a wheelchair and pretty much had no control of his hands or anything but he was he was like 
we're going to do this. And so it is that the, our ice bucket challenge, myself and Mike, is on YouTube. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, that in itself is, it, it kind of gives you a glimpse of how determined Mike was. He, to do this, we had to remove his breathing mask. So in effect, he's holding his breath whilst pouring this ice over him um, to help raise awareness for motor neuron disease, for ALS, and help donate towards it. And, and then he made me do it. And it wasn't just, you know, that I could have ice pour over me. He had sent Laura out, his partner, to go local charity shop and get me. I had to wear like a, a dress, a, a cowboy boots, you know, like like a scarf thing. And yeah, and eat chili as well and bite into chili. So it's kind of like that gave me a hint of what was coming with the bucket list is what he <laughs> will make you do. But well, yeah, it was a great way of <laughs> the timing of the release of this new book, um, you know, uh, talking about this is so critically important. Um, you know, this book out, you know, we're coming, we're still in the middle of a pandemic We're most of us are out of quarantine now, but, you know, millions of people, uh, uh, millions of families have lost people over the last two years. Um, and I guess my this question, Cliff, did this book speak to you since you lost your brother during the pandemic? Um, don't get me started. Um, some of us have processed more than others have when you've lost someone as close as your brother. Um, in my case, it was my older brother by two and a half years. And Royd, in your case, it was your younger brother, Mike. Um, I had the great pleasure of meeting um, Mike on one of your journeys where uh, Bruce Hopkins actually took us to the Black Sand Beach on the North Island. You remember that? Of course you do. Yeah, but it wasn't Bruce. It wasn't Bruce. It was it was Larry. It wasn't Bruce. I thought Bruce helped us get up there. Wasn't he with us that day? I don't know. It was yourself and Larry and my, Mike and I. I think oh, that's Mike, right. Yeah, and Larry, yes. Taking you there at some point in the past and you had rem- remembered this incredible beach to go to. And so when- oh, That's Mike right, was yeah. There, I, I, it was fresh on the memory of Bruce having taken me there, yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. Well, honestly, um, there's, there's a way to memorialize someone and I, you've done it right, okay? I haven't gotten to this point in, in my processing where I've been able to memorialize my brother. Um, I think that I think my brother's legacy lives on with the success of the space shuttle program. He was for many, many, many years the chief electrical engineer, and everybody at NASA depended on my brother. All of the wow. design engineers who were creating things had only one person on staff who could take the paperwork and the drawings and make it a real technical reality with wow. wiring and and all the protective gear and all the technology and i think my brother's legacy lives on in the success of the space program far more than ever any any other story or approach that i could ever tell um but there's there is something that i have in my hands and i've been i've been finishing the book slowly because i don't want it to end um it has it has processed a lot of tears and a lot of joy in in me just reading this book, and and I can't thank you enough for it, Roy. Oh. Um, as a forewarning to all of our Lord of the Rings audience, um, there are endless endless Easter eggs and surprise treats in this book, all across the beautiful beautiful island universe of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and oh, back again, and back and back again, and. For, for those who are wondering, you know, should I get this? It's like the best possible gift that you could give to any Lord of the Rings fan this Christmas because it is so easily read. It is so beautiful. And you're going to get a lot of emotional mileage out of it. You know that mileage you feel at the end of, you know, the Grey Havens and you're closing the book and you're thinking, bloody hell, why am I crying like a 10-year-old schoolgirl 
who just mm -hmm. fell down and scraped her knee on the sidewalk. And that's because you're finishing the story about Mike and you're understanding why you're presenting this, Royd, to your son story and for the benefit of, of other others. You, 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 this is about you writing this book, I can tell, but it's mm -hmm. also about others having awareness that love and the love you have for your family will take you farther than you've ever, ever dreamed you could ever go. And it's such a powerful lesson. So I, I can't tell you how beautiful and very, very moving this experience has been for me. So um, yeah, I, I kept it together when I said that. So oh, yeah. thank you so much. That That's beautiful. That really is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. No. No, I well meant, and I can't. I, I just can't wait to see what happens with the footage in this documentary. You know, well, it's, it's that it's it's it will be released at some point. Is mm. all I can say at the moment. At some point, where it will be and when, I just don't know. But it will be, and I should send a copy to Justin. But actually, he's got a history with not reading books, don't you, Justin? <gasps> oh, scandalous! Yeah, I remember. I wonder if he's read. Hobbit, Lord of the Rings. Ah, that would be a no. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. <laughs> uh oh. How do you remember these things? You have you have bigger fish to fry. I I, I have my pocket <laughs> Hobbit here. Uh, I'm not quite done with it yet. Oh. Oh, wow. Is that? I, I spent a lot working on my autobiography. Ah. <laughs> 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 oh, Amazon gave you a deal too. No, I wish. I just did this off my own recognition. It took me a long time to get to through page one and then page two. Yeah, but it's 2020, brilliant. 2021. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, Pocket Hobbit, uh, Lord of the Rings. Um, did you guys, did both of you uh, uh, connect with The Hobbit as much with Lord of the Rings? And and did, have you, did you guys connect with the Silmarillion? Like, you know, What's your favorite story out of all I, of these? I try and read the Silmarillion at least once a year because it's, I forget the names. There are so many names in there, but um, I've been reminded of the story of Glorfindel. Um, you know, he goes, people forget that he actually re-substituted. You know, he was brought back to life by the gods and sent to the, to the third age, having been in the first and second age, or at least the first age anyway. Um, so I've just remembered that from, from the Silmarillion. I, I read a little article online and went, ah, oh, that character. He's a, it's an, that's an amazing character in terms of what he goes through. He's the person who put Frodo on the white horse. It's not, that's not depicted in the film. It's depicted differently. Um, he stays and fights the Nazgul and, and holds them up so that Frodo can get away. Um, it, kind of a cool, very cool character from the Silmarillion. Are you... Uh, yeah. Are Lithium. you... Um, so if you, if you read the Silmarillion that much, not that they have any rights to this, but are, as a fan, are you excited about going to the second age? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 th I remember we did a thing for the fans where I interviewed Peter Jackson under his edit suite and he had, he had, he mocked up these six or seven scripts for the Silmarillion. <laughs> we talked about it at that time. I said, no one will ever do it. It's too hard to do. You know, having Lord of the Rings, having been done, obviously, you know, there's a, if there's a will, there's a way. But I also didn't think that anyone would even get the rights to it. But it is, it's, it's a very hard, it's a lot harder book to read than The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. It's got, you have to keep going back. It's not a kind of a linear thing. It jumps around the place in time. But it's also, there are so many characters in it, so many great characters in it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited that someone has even attempted it because I think that there's so much depth in there. There's so much, um, there's so many fish to fry, so to speak. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm, go ahead, Justin. I was about to say something probably quite stupid, but go ahead, Justin. Go well, ahead. I'm in my ear, the attorneys are telling me to remind everybody that Amazon only has rights to the appendices, not the Silmarillion. We just, yeah. we're all just fans of the book, yeah. the Silmarillion and the stories. Uh, mm -hmm. And so legal, that, that's the legal disclaimer. But speaking of like the two things, uh, uh, you, uh, Jed, you were talking about how energized the entire 
country of New Zealand was 20 years ago. Um, yeah. uh, how did years even 10 years ago with the Hobbit? How, yeah. uh, what's the vibe? What's been the vibe in New Zealand during the pandemic? While Lord of the Rings has been shooting, like, it, is there a has there been like a renewed sense of energy? Like, oh my God, we're doing it for a third time. Yeah, I, you know, there's a positivity that comes with working with great stories. Not everybody gets to do stories of this depth, and we we are the lucky country. We, you know, we don't. No one would have thought before Peter Jackson got the rights. I don't think anyone in New Zealand would ever thought that we would shoot something of that kind of high art, I guess, you know, mm. in terms of its literature. We've, we've got a history of making quite dark and brooding stories that kind of go with the landscape and also the kind of energy in the country. Lord of the Rings was something that we never thought we would attain and having done that and then getting the right to do The Hobbit again. A lot of those same crew members were on The Hobbit. I think a lot of the same crew members probably worked on the Amazon series. And I think that that kind of flow through with the IP of Weta um, with the landscape, I think it's a really good thing. I think the country loved it. Um, you know, from, from, from what I've been told, I don't know anything personally, but in terms of people that I saw that were working on the crew, they seem to be enjoying themselves. So yeah, I think, I think at any time when you're working on something that has a pedigree that is so loved, there's a determination to try and get it right. And that brings out the best in people. And you know, um, we were we talked about it being super excited to see rings when it first came out fellowship the excitement of seeing it i'm getting that kind of buzz again yeah i don't know if you are but it's kind of exciting isn't it i am i'm i'm getting that buzz at the same time i've been very nervous and feeling yeah. a little a little bit of trepidation but when i realize what is in the larger canvas of second age storytelling we have, we have some of the greatest moments of treachery with the elves being duped by Sauron. And he's running around doing a perfect Loki, pretending to be something he is not. And then, I mean, an, the whole Anatar storyline is going to give us a chance for, um, you know, wondering who is really the shapeshifter that Sauron is pretending to be now. You know, we, we don't know how far is it going to go. Well, the flat earth is going to be made round. There is cap cataclysm in this story yeah, on the you know, largest scale possible. Yeah, I guess we'll find out at some point, won't we? Yeah. Some yeah. Point, I, I get that. Yeah. You know. The yeah, safest okay. answer possible. <laughs> yeah, at some point in time, we will know the answers. We'll, we'll know the answers at yeah. some point, won't we? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just, I want to see the camera pulled back to the whole planet, Arda, and see the whole thing being made round. I just, that's all I want to see. It's just crazy yeah. pants. Um, yeah. There's, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on there that probably was too ambitious for Peter and company to do in the second age. It's pretty wild storytelling, really. It is wild storytelling, and there's, there's a lot of scope there in terms of it's not just in Middle Earth. There's mm. all these other places as well. You know, we exactly, we, exactly. Yeah, there, there's there's um, there's Numenor, there's um, Turian, there's Valinor. There's you know, where 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 you, you can really tell he's a fan. <laughs> he knows. I'm a huge fan. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a total geek. I think I think that was the thing about working with Pete was he's, you know, mm. people forget that it was the Ralph Bansky film that really made him want to make that film at some point. Um, he's mm. a huge fan as well. And, and he said back in the day that he wanted to make the type of film that he himself would want to watch. And I think that makes the difference in terms of how far you go and how far you push it. We, we did long hours on those films and we did long hours in The Hobbit as well. But um, as an actor, you want to, you want to be pushed to places that aren't comfortable. And Pete certainly likes to push actors to a place that aren't comfortable. Uh, that just just going back to the Hobbit, I remember Martin Freeman saying, "My stunt double will do that." I was like, "No, he won't. It'll be you." <laughs> if you have to run up a hill and you're puffing when you get there, you don't have to act the being exhausted part. You just have to do the acting bit. And when one of the actors said, "Oh, my, I'm sick of running up hills," he went, "Yeah, but you, you don't have to act that bit. <laughs> you know, you are, you're exhausted, and then you can just do the acting stuff." 
I, hey, I just, I, I'm, I'm ready for you to get back into the studio and record your next Dwarven album singing songs. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. Me too. I'm Me ready. too. Yeah. I, I, I have a recording contract with Warner, so I'm sure I can get yeah. him to put me that thing. <laughs> well, speaking of like uh, Uber fans and singing and stuff, you guys have been coming out of this pandemic. You guys have been touring uh, all over Europe. Um, what, what's what yeah. been the energy and the vibe uh, 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 what you're doing right now? Well, I, you know, like everyone, we've been like locked away. I've been, I've been here in Wales for pretty much the year and a half of, during lockdown. Um, but um, this was uh, the opportunity to do this uh, tour presenting the music from Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. And I was like, I just wanted to do it with a mate and have a have a giggle around Europe. And so luckily enough, Jed was uh, was around. And so he joined and we we went around. We went to Stockholm. We had Oslo, Stavanger in Norway. We had uh, we first stop was in Berlin. We went to a bunch of different Helsinki, Helsinki. Um, Turku, uh, Tempere in Finland. Yeah. Um, Went to the Hague, uh, Malmo in Sweden. Malmo, yeah. So a yeah. bunch of different places and West End. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, okay. It was it was a it was a real thrill to be able to to give something to people that have been locked away as we had. So we was a, as excited to get out as the people that came and watched the show, and the uh, and being able to be on stage again and connect with people and look at people was incredible and yeah. also to be like have this music surround us that Howard Shaw's beautiful orchestral yeah. music um and the, the guys that performed it that from Rom Romania were incredible incredibly talented and yeah uh, the conductor Alex was I mean everyone involved were just so great all the the, the cast and crew basically yeah it I, was a real joy it was and and, and you touched on that what well, these people have been waiting two years it, it was it was um it was put off and then it was put off and it was put off and they finally for some of them it was um christmas presents they've been given or a birthday yeah, present someone yeah. had given them a ticket um there were people who were waiting to get married um you know um and this was kind of their wedding present to each other there was a lot of different kind of aspects to what we were doing and we got standing ovations simply i think because people were so overjoyed to be in touch with the music again mm. in a group setting yeah um not just at home you know streaming <laughs> streaming something through their tv but being out there's something about live theater too there's something about the fact that you get immediate feedback from people you know we did a little double act and we got <laughs>, laughs we got people laughing and it's it's um it's very addictive yeah when someone laughs at something that you say um, it makes you feel good and then you that energy goes backwards and forwards the energy of being on stage with a live orchestra if you've never done it it is mm. i've never experienced it before yeah it was it blew my mind it yeah. absolutely blew my mind i was i was there were nights when I was in tears and I had to hold it together because it was so beautiful. Mm. And it took we me, did, yeah, it took we me did a uh, uh, a new a reunion of the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra that recorded were, were the first to record Howard Shore's music. And uh, you talked about um, Weta inscribing Theoden's armor on the inside. Um, the 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 orchestra leader said on the first day where. They had 80 musicians all being paid their hourly rate, right? So it's an expensive day. Howard Shore spent the first day telling the musicians the history of the dwarves. Wow. Wow. And and everyone mm. was like, time is money. We've never we've never been exposed to this. But Howard said, it's important that you know where this music is coming from. And, and then they started recording the next day. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's part of the magic and the power of this music is that the care that yeah. went into the creation of the music and then into the recording of it was that level of care. And then we're still enthralled with it 20 years later. And we're going, we're going to theaters and stages to, to just to listen to it. You know, um, when they recorded the music for the film, um, I was lucky enough to be invited to Abbey Road and Pete was there and Howard was recording the score with the London Philharmonic in Abbey Road. Mind blowing uh, anyway. 
Um, and so I remember being sat in the control booth and I was sat on a couch behind and Pete was there at the desk with engineers and through the window was Howard Shaw, London Philharmonic, everyone all out there. I can't remember what the particular piece was, but the, the piece of film would be played on the screen in the recording booth, as well as in, in you know, in the, where the orchestra were. And this particular bit was recorded live. And I remember Peter sitting like this with his hands on and he leant back in his chair. And so he was quite close to me. And I looked at his arms and I could see goosebumps on his arms. And it was, I mean, that, after that, all of that, and this was Return of the King, after that incredibly long time doing all of that and working and being incredibly exhausted, you know, and he must have been exhausted, just to be sat back there and to see him react with goosebumps was, was a moment. Going back to the fellowship, there's a story I should tell of when we watched the rushes of the black horses galloping down the river, when the white, when the river rises up and washes them away. We're in a little uh, little place in Arrowtown, a little theatre in Arrowtown with a screen up there. All of the black riders that had been working that day were invited to go and watch Rushes. And Peter was there. I think Andrew Lesney was there. Um, some of the first ADs, some of the crew were there. I was sitting right behind Pete. He didn't know I was a black rider. No one had told him that I was even working for the horse department at that point. So he didn't know I was in the room. And he was... He usually sits back, he was sitting on the edge and he just went at the end of it, he just went, oh my, yeah, that was, oh, that was just, oh, sort of got up and sat down and got up and sat down and we knew that we'd made the boss happy. It, it was an amazing moment for me as someone who was a little bit jaded from working those long days. It energized that horse department in a way that they hadn't been before. It made us realize that, you know, to make the boss happy is one thing, but to make him happy, yeah. someone who'll do 43 takes, this was like, we, we knew that we'd nailed it because it was shot by um, John Mahaffey's second unit. And this was the first time that Peter had seen it. And he was absolutely amped. He was so excited about what this was gonna do for the audience. And those moments, if I didn't ever do anything again in my career, yeah. having worked on those films, doing this stuff, I would be happy. I would go, cool, I'm okay. Back absolutely, uh, absolutely. You are, you are in the rarefied air. Mr. Brophy, that very, very few, very few people get to experience that. And I'm, I'm, I, I don't know how to say this, but um, it's just, I'm, I'm as much of a geek, obviously, as anybody else is about this stuff. And, and to see that kind of love and attention to detail yeah. that everybody was putting into, there's a whole hierarchy in the system of making a film production of that scale and you couldn't miss a detail from the lower levels of the roots to the main trunk of the tree right with peter and everybody in between in this mm -hmm. network people were hardcore fans when i was wandering around um unattended on a set where the pyre of denethor had been set up and they were uh john noble was burning poor david wenham to bits and Gandalf has to come in on shadow facts with Pippin and you know stop this horror at the moment all of that had been filmed in that space a couple of days before and yet I was able to walk around and see the interior of the the, the tombs and I looked around uh, and I realized that underneath every beautiful beautiful sculpture the statue th there were dozens and dozens of names and dates and those were all the past kings of Minas Tirith and they were accurate to the bloody book and there were tiny inscriptions on all these beautiful statues yeah. the camera was never ever ever intended to pick up on those details and yet just like you were describing the uh ins the inscription inside Bernard Hill's armor there were those inscriptions across the entire set for like the dead ancestors of Minas Tirith that the audience would never see on camera. And yet the people in the department so carefully and faithfully had all that information sculpted all across the set. And I was just so blown away by that. And I, I, I'm telling you, you know more than I do, I'm sure. 
that that kind of love and effort was everywhere from the top down. It was, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, people took it seriously. I mean, we take it seriously in the film industry anyway. No one wants to get caught out, um, you know, making a blunder, but especially with this, I, I think... The more oh, you mean like a coffee cup, a Starbucks cup in the banquet scene? Oh, yeah. I that. know. I mean, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> back, back to the music. Correct me if I'm wrong, but whenever you hear that, da -da -da, da -da -da -da, you know, the Hobbit music. Yeah. Makes me feel good every yeah. time on stage. Yeah. yeah, on stage with the Yorkshire women being there. As soon as they play that, I'm like, I'm in a good place. Yeah, it's it's Hobbiton. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's Frodo and yeah. Bilbo yeah. And, and Gandalf and good times before the darkness. Um, you know, there's something about what strings, what what the violin and what the cello, and and the oboe. It's something yeah. what it does to your to your heartstrings. It's um, it's been a joy. I, I would be dancing in the wings because it was the first song they would play. Well, the, uh, uh, the, the, another song, but the second song they'd play. But I was in the wings uh, for this tour when that music would be playing. And they would, no matter how tired I was, I would literally be like, D -d 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 yeah. I'd be dancing around. It was brilliant. <laughs> it's a really energizing song to come on to. Yeah. There are those themes that um, when you hear it, doesn't matter where you hear it, you immediately take him back to that place in the film. <clears throat> You know that time in the film or whatever where that's kind of up to in the chapter it's been a joy yeah yeah the 20 think... years ago when the movies came out uh we're three months away uh, out of 9 11 the entire world had felt the pain of what happened and you know it's like uh, is it time to go back to the cinemas and lord of the rings was what was was the <coughs> cure uh you, you know the, the movies did what uh, great stories always do, which is which is uh, expose us to um, all the emotions of life. Uh, so wh what do you think? And then Lord of the Rings, uh, we kept seeing throughout the pandemic, whether it was Josh Gad doing a reunion or Stephen Colbert doing a reunion or all of these 10 different versions of Lord of the Rings in 4K that you can buy. Uh, something about these stories in the darkest of, of human times have have uh, keep keep us going so what do you think it is about these movies and uh and these stories that that are so received and important worldwide like w what is it about this well i i think that films it's because of the source material uh, and you're kind of biased it. though mr tolkien oh yeah <laughs> I, I i agree i think i think yeah what jr Tolkien managed to do was to write a story that was accessible yeah. to everybody. You could all relate to somebody who puts their own life at risk for the good of the entire free world, you know, for the good of trying to find the light. There is something about that source material that is so how we all feel inside. You know, there is that positivity that, yeah, okay, things are really, really tough and there is this darkness approaching, but if if just one person makes a difference, then it can make a difference to everybody. You know, Frodo doesn't have to put his entire life at risk to get the ring to Mount Doom, but he decides to do it. And because he decides to do it, a fellowship is formed to try and get him there. They all put everything on the line to make it happen because the alternative is to let darkness win. And I think that we can all relate to that. And, mm. and, and the more there are these things, these adversities that we have to come up against, the more that that actually is important to hang on to. And, and I've had people come up to conventions and they've said, they've broken down and cried and said, these films literally changed my life. Mm. They turned around what was a really, really dark time into making me feel like I had something of worth or that I could be, you know, I was important too. And I think, I think that's why these films will, will stand the test of time. I really do. I think that there's always going to be a need for us to feel better about the fact that we had to struggle through something. Mm. And I think well you know, said, very well said. Is um, that also is that I think we enjoy going back to them because we enjoy the films and we enjoy that first time we watch them and we remember that excitement from watching them. And I think because Jed's with me until you leave in January, so Jed's got his first Christmas in Wales. I do. Um, I think we should actually, you know watch what, the film. watch all the films, the extended should. edition. Yeah, yeah. I, I've done twice now, I've done the entire marathon of watching all of the extended versions of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings back to back at the Roxy Cinema in Wellington. Mm -hmm. And I stayed for all of them. 
Now I could have gone away and had a cup of tea and whatever, but I stayed and someone said it must have been arduous. And I was like, actually, it was the best 24 hours of my life because <laughs> I'm all of them. <laughs> I can pick myself out and go, yeah, that's where I was actually out with yeah. You know. Actually, I don't want to watch the films of you because if you go, no, there's me, Roy, there's me, be, shut up. No, but it is. It is. I, I thought it was going to be quite grueling, but actually it was quite energizing because they're, I mean, I know that a lot of the people don't rate the Hobbit films, but I, I do. I'm very proud of them. I think they're amazing. And I think that if you're a true fan of the work, then you're a true fan of those films as well. I, I hate hearing people bag them. I don't know that they'll stand the test of time as artistic pieces as much as Lord of the Rings because it was first. But I still think as a group of six films, there are no better group of six films on the planet today. And I, I'd challenge anyone to come up with six better films to watch as a marathon. Well, if right. if if you if you guys do end up watching uh, these movies during the holidays, and uh, give me a ring and let's turn on your webcam so we can all watch it together. I want to watch <laughs> Lord of the Rings with you guys. Let's we'll do a virtual thing. <laughs> Actually, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, when we do like live torn Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> We should. You know, I'm 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 excited about this uh, very good friend of mine who has never seen the Lord of the Rings before, and is getting ready to experience the 20th anniversary of the films by starting and watching the extended edition trilogy. And um, I have been begging this person to record it and make a reaction video. Oh you know, yeah. Oh. It, I mean, th those are really really cool watching people's reaction videos who've never read or seen these films, never read the books. So I'm fascinated by that. I get to personally be the Tolkien guy on hold so that every time he hits pause, he can be like, so where are they now and why are they over there and what? Who, who's related to who? So I get to do that for people. I do it all the time. You know, you, you do this a lot for friends. So there's, there's something about that and you don't share that with a lot of other franchises. People okay. don't ever sit around and say, I'm going to hold your hand through all of these Harry Potter films or Star Wars films. Yeah. People don't necessarily do that the way that we do. We delight in sharing well, this with It's people. not just us. It's, it's Peter and the filmmakers. I, I was just doing the numbers because there's all these new uh, 4K releases. And there are four commentary tracks on the extended editions of Lord of the Rings. There's two commentary tracks on The Hobbit, or one, yeah. one or two, plus just the regular movie, no commentary. If you just watch the movies, not the appendices and BTS, if you just watched all of the movies with commentaries, it's 75 hours. <laughs> I know. I know. It's, it's, a, it's not just a marathon. It's a marathon. It's two marathons. Yeah. <laughs> the whole of New York. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I think it's well worth the watch. It's well worth the effort this Christmas to sit down and remind ourselves about why there is so much kind of love for these films. Yeah. yeah I mean, well, I've, been, I've, I've traveled the world, you know, getting up on stage and telling lies and stories from from my experiences, and I don't imagine that any other franchise would have given me that opportunity. So for me, it's been. It's, you know, it's been well over half my career has been involved in this particular franchise, and I'm I'm lucky. I'm glad I'm glad you don't feel typecast. I don't I don't care. Yeah, acting acting was a job to me, and and this kind of I think being a part of this elevated that job from from just entertaining people. This has actually done more than just entertain people. It's also it's it's people have said it's changed their life it's you know it's not everyone gets the opportunity to touch people and to move them in that way and a smaller part that I had in that I still feel associated with the fact that I was part of something that does that for people it's a it's a positive thing hey you know um when it was being announced about Hobbit and the uh, cast when it was announced that Jed was on, I literally was like, God damn it, yes! <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, Jed has nailed a lot of roles and rings, but this was like, it was like, you know, you, it, I like your mate, it made it like, oh, good, God bless you. You know, like everyone yeah. clapping, officer or a gentleman when he carries her out, and it's like, yeah, go for it. 
<laughs> it was brilliant. I, it was like, God damn it, that's amazing. I, when my agent rang me to tell me I was alone in the house and I vacillated between shouting yes and crying. And crying, <laughs> and crying. My neighbor thought that something bad had happened. He went, are you okay? Really? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I, I didn't think I would ever get the opportunity. I was happy for my mates that had been cast, the ones that I knew, but I had no idea that I was going to be cast in the film. So I was, yeah, I was really very moved knowing that I was going to be going back to Middle Earth. Roy, uh, do you remember the day where you heard that they're doing the Lord of the Rings movies, big budget style? I, I don't remember the day. I just remember knowing about it. And like I mentioned earlier, thinking, um, what, the, that that guy did Brain Dead and Bad yeah. Taste. Yeah. <laughs> Making those films. That's like, really? Wow. You know, right. this, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> Um, but yet I, I don't remember the exact I couldn't pinpoint the time I just remember when I heard about it and it would have just been some so it out. didn't it, it didn't come from like a family Christmas letter you know where everybody catches up like <laughs> oh and by the way <laughs> uh, it, was, it, it, it was like you know I think I don't know whether it was like my brother or sister had phoned and was like hey you know what I just heard like read online somewhere or, you know. At the one ring dot net, they read. <laughs> well, you know what? You, your website was the go-to place for me. It's where, in fact, it was probably the only place that I would look at information and snippets of and leaks and pictures and on-set photos and, you know, sets from the hill overlooking some, <laughs> you know. Uh, it was where I went to all the time for information was your site. And, and throughout rings, into Hobbit, in between all of that, and now. So it's been the go-to for me, your site. It's been brilliant. See, Amazon, if you're watching, uh, we help inform the Tolkien family members and related folks. So uh, no more DMCAs. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. You know, we all know. I, um, I had to have a reason to bring out this hat today because I've had it I've had this hat sitting in cold oh. storage Hang on, in, a, in a refrigerated case for um, a very, very long, long, long time. And I had to break this out. Um, do I need to buy you another set of readers, Roy? No, I'm, f I'm fine. I, I, oh, you, Jed? Jed? Okay, there you go, Jed. <laughs> I, I, I can read it. I was just pretending for you know, <laughs> some, I, I tell you what, some of the most valuable pieces of collector's items ever are the crew jackets and the crew gear. Yes. Didn't they issue a whole bunch of different ones for 100 days or 300 days? Like, how far day did one, that go? Day 133, um, there was also all the different departments. There was the horse department had their own ones. I have one of the Rohan embroidered jackets from the horse department. There were only 21 made. Um, mm. There were t-shirts for the lighting department. There were t-shirts for the stunt department. There were ones made, I survived home seat for the people <laughs> that survived home seat. Um, there was one, we'll, we'll always have Twizel for those of us that were there doing the big gallops for the fields of Pelennor. Oh um, yeah, we'll always have Twizel. <laughs> we'll always have Twizel, yeah. Um, there was the day 133 jackets that were made, um, that Peter had made, which was mm. sort of roughly halfway through the first shoot. For the Hobbit, there was the Little Bastards, <laughs> which were just the dwarves and Gandalf and um, and Bilbo, and they were made just for the thirteen dwarves and for Martin Freeman and for Ian McKellen. So that was a special kind of run of just fifteen. Um, yeah, there was. I mean, I have a lot of those t-shirts, and and I put them away because I was wearing them all the time, and then I was like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be able to get these again. They're kind of one offs. <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> I, I I generously, but also perhaps quite silly, gave a few away to fans at conventions, threw them out into the audience. I want them back if you're watching. <laughs> oh my <laughs> gosh, you did not. You did not. I did, I did. I did. Wow. Um, we, we did use a lot of them for um, raising money for charities and I, and I don't, you know, I don't question that. That's always a good thing to do. But for those that I did throw out there into the audience of those conventions, please just send them back to New Zealand. Someone will find them. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is... um. This is a, a time of, of greater perspective, I think. Uh, we've had the benefit of 20 years of time to take a, a look back at the movies um, and 
and we're, we're able to acknowledge how it impacted us way back then, culturally, especially with America feeling the extreme wounds that it was feeling at the time when Fellowship came out. And there was that special version of a poster that New Line Cinema released, and it featured a never before seen uh, photo still of Frodo and Gandalf having that conversation in Moria. And there's that famous dialogue that uh, Gandalf has where he says, uh, so do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. Uh, mm -hmm. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. And they distributed that poster. New Line Cinema didn't realize, maybe they did, but that was an effort for us to have a cultural conversation. And even now, all these years later, we're looking at these films as a source of unifying and healing people mm -hmm. in a way that cinema rarely can ever do. Very rare yeah. for something to have this much impact. And then in a larger framework, all these decades later, it's a film that has been admitted, accepted into the National Film Registry here, here in the United States. And all around the world, people I know who are struggling with obesity or anxiety or depression, they're, they're the first people to tell me there is something therapeutic and very powerful when I watch these stories and I put the discs back on to experience this world again. It is healing. It is, there's something that we've, maybe this is a perspective that we've never talked about in greater nuance, but maybe we should give it a look. That there's something healing about this storytelling. And maybe I haven't put my finger on it yet, but I'm so grateful that it was done the way it was done with the integrity that was put into the project, the you know, fidelity to Tolkien, as it were. We, we use that phrase a lot around here at the wondering.net, but I think you guys know where I'm going with this. Yeah. Mm. Indeed, and I, I don't even, I don't think we even need to know what the magic is of why these films do it. Just mm. embrace the fact that they do and, and share it with, with people. Share that. It, it's a, we talked about the fact that we do a lot of stuff that's just pure entertainment and it's fluff. And it's mm. great at the moment, but it doesn't last. But there is something about these films in terms of the way that it lasts in our hearts. And I, I don't, I can't put my finger on exactly what it is. I don't think it's one thing. I think it's, as I said before, they managed to get a cast of people that were amazing people that happened to be great actors. But they were amazing people first. Mm. We got really lucky. But they're also amazing characters. They're all rounded characters. They're well written. Mm. They have a kind of a life to them that is that has been, you know, he's drawn that from magic, he's drawn it from his knowledge of the earth and the knowledge of people. And they are people that we can all relate to. We all know a legalist, we all know a Bilba Bagan, we all know a Gandalf. There's something about them that is kind of so comfortable to us mm. as characters. They're comfortable. It's mm -hmm. like putting your, your best slippers in your, in your, your smoking jacket or whatever and feeling like, oh yeah. When you watch the films, it's satisfying. I don't know what the magic is, but whatever it is, I'm glad it came around. I agree. And it is something you want to share with the young ones. Uh, yeah. Lloyd, remember your little anecdote a little bit ago about how you felt when The Hobbit was read to you? Mm. You see, the quality in Professor Tolkien's books is a shared quality that Peter Jackson and company have with these beautiful films. You want to share them. Yes. It's not just a, a forgettable piece of a blockbuster that's just cotton candy and you forget about it, that you ate it yesterday. It's something that weeks from now, months from now, oh hell, decades from now, you yeah. want to share this filmmaking or this book with your children, with your young ones. That, I think, is the magic alchemy that we can't put our fingers on. It's mm -hmm. really something about it, really. Yeah, I think it's also um, good to remember that people seeing the film wanted to go and buy the book if they hadn't. Yeah, it also generated uh, you know a huge spike in book sales, I and mean, that's a good thing. Literature is giving giving someone a book. You talked about imagination, what it does. I remember when I read it mm. in terms of 
in my head what those characters looked like and who they were. And I think that that's uh, another great aspect of what these films did was it generated a whole um, interest in people reading again as well. Mm. I think it's been very positive. Well, as we wrap up this conversation, I have one final question for each uh -oh. of you. I want, and I get, and I, that question is. And the answer is you can get it on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> America, Canada, the UK, um, uh, Australia as well. And Jed's and book comes out, comes in, out tomorrow in 14 tomorrow, different languages. But this isn't live, so tomorrow for you guys is in five years. <laughs> is it only in English? No, sorry. Thank you. German as Thank well. you. It's available in uh, Germany as well. It's just released in Germany. And it's getting translated into Russian. And it's going to oh. be translated into New Zealand as well. Beautiful. You know what? There's something we haven't even said yet. The title oh. of the book, the title of the book, ladies yes. and gentlemen, is There's a Hole in My Bucket. And it is a, a, an incredibly revealing and very personally moving memoir. It's a story of love and a great deal of delicious, fun <laughs> revenge. A lot of fun, brotherly revenge. And I, I'm joking. I'm joking, of course. Wait, are, are you? Absolutely. Were you joking about Russian? No, it is. It is being translated into Russian. I, I know. Yeah, because according to my research, yeah. the first three languages that Tolkien's Lord of the Rings published in was English, German, and Russian, in that order. Wow! What? There you go. And that's that's really. So and it's exactly that order for me as well. What was your last question, Justin, just to get back to you? All right, it's a 20th anniversary is it week. About, is it about the books? It's, a, it's, 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 available it's about the books. <laughs> Sorry, what's the real question? Uh, if it's not about these books, then I don't want to know. Jed, <laughs> you said that fans have come up to you for the last 20 years saying how, how these films change their lives. And that's the question I want to ask both of you. 20 years on, how did Fellowship change your life, the movie? Uh, it gave me it gave me opportunities that I didn't have before in terms of traveling the world and getting to meet people. And, you know, when, when you, I mainly did theater before um, working with Peter. I didn't realize that you could have uh, a relationship with a whole lot of fans in other countries. It was very parochial. It was very the city that I worked in. To be able to travel the world and meet other people who are fans of the book, who also have lives, get, getting to know them and getting to know their perspective on the world has been amazing. And that I, it's, it's a privilege to have been in these films in terms of what it's given to me, in terms of my ability to travel and meet people and to, and to have a shared love of the, of the literary work and a shared love of the films. It's, it's, it's opened up a whole world to me that I didn't know existed. So that for me, I think, is the number one takeaway. Yeah, same for me. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's given me the ability to um, travel beyond Wales, you know, uh, go to New Zealand. I've made lots of friends um, within the films, but outside of the films, like you guys, you know, and it gives me yeah. the opportunity to make friends with people that I would not necessarily have made friends with or just having never met. But, you know, I've got what I think is and what I, I hope is a good friendship with you guys that is thrilling. And I know that if I'm ever over in LA or you ha ever happen to be in Wales, we would be just hanging out. You'd be staying here. I'd be staying with you. It yeah. would just. We, we got to swim at the Roosevelt swimming pool at the Roosevelt hotel. <laughs> Clifford, do you remember? Yes, I, remember. I do. I do. Yes. We get to stay there, let alone be able to walk straight across the road to that iconic cinema that has all the premieres that I watched on movie after movie after movie yeah. and, and, you know, news thing going, ah, oh, lucky walking the red carpet. But I also think that red carpet event in New Zealand with 100,000 people turning up, I don't think it gets any better than that. Yeah. I don't think, oh. I, I don't think you can, you can kind of top the experience of being in the city that I lived in, in Wellington, and have that many people crowding the streets full of love and full of celebration. That, that's a once in a lifetime event. I think you had uh, how many miles of red carpet through Wellington for the Return of the King world premiere? I don't know, the, the biggest red carpet in history. I think it was four, it was over four miles, yeah. four miles of red carpet yeah. through Wellington, through the, you know, the business district and all the way up 
I think it went all the way to the Beehive. I'm not they mistaken. Started, they, they started at Parliament and they ended at the theatre. Now, a funny thing happened. We, we'd been to the cast and crew screening with my son, Seven, because he was only six. We'd, our friends of ours had offered to take him for the day so we could walk the red carpet on our own. We got a phone call because they went to the red carpet event that some guy in a car had our son. Vigo saw him in the audience on the red carpet <laughs> and grabbed him and put him in the car for a little while down the red carpet. So we were thinking, oh my goodness, someone's kidnapped our son and he's with this weird guy. <laughs> and there he is in the car with Vigo. <laughs> That's genius. I love it. You know, it's, I feel it feels like family. That's really what it feels like to me. Being a, a, a writer and a contributor for all these people who volunteer for the one ring.net that's all we've been doing making ourselves a little family location on the interwebs for people to come and feel like they're at the table sharing the table with us with with bilbo and balin and you know the the you know someone says pass me the seed cakes and someone else says yeah sure pass me the pipe and we're just relaxing and this it really does feel like that. And I, I'm just so grateful. I'm grateful to the fandom, to the ongoing sense of community that we have over all this time. And you guys, to you especially, I'm grateful to you for being with us and, and sharing your experiences and your stories. And um, especially now, uh, uh, Royd, a very big gold star to you for sharing a story of love and grief and reconcilement and and beautiful beautiful stuff um you've you've got a great thing going here and i can't imagine how good it's going to be when we get to see the film version of there's a hole in my bucket um mr brophy maybe at some point because i'm a little bit scared of horses maybe you can help me with that and get me some basic equestrian training so i can yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i'd love that it really does come down to just spending time with the animal and it comes down to mileage. Um, you know, they, yeah. they're, they're as scared of the, of the moment of you getting on as you are. But horses don't want to hurt you. They want to try and look after you. It's just them being confident that the person on their back is confident. It really comes exactly. down to Exactly. See? Really with that. Yeah. I have to do that. I have to do that. I have to learn. Not, I have to learn. Not my own personal horse because he is one of the last of the Rohirrim horses. He's 25 now. He's oh, a, my God. A veteran of the films. He started his first shot was busting out of Helm's Deep. And um, he is in the paddock now where we shot the reshoots for the mama kill coming down outside the gates of Palinor. He's still in that same paddock 20 years on. And he wow. has to tell. I see him up at the gate smoking a cigarette and there in his smoking <laughs> jacket telling the other horses about how Gandalf patted him one day and, and, and the people that he knocked over and the good times that he had. So, you know... Um, yeah, it's, it's nice to know that he's still around and he's celebrating 21 years of, of, um, of the films as well. Well, coming oh up soon, a Torn Tuesday exclusive. So awesome. It's so awesome. Thank you. Thank you both for being here and, you know, coming, coming uh, you know, uh, over to the, the, the little community that could, the little Tolkien website that could. And so here we are, 20 years later. My yeah. favorite website on the entire interweb, or whatever they call it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Thank you, guys. Thank Love you. you both very much. Yeah. Are we done now? Because, Jed, get the fuck out of my house. Oh, sorry. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. I really have overstayed my welcome. What's he doing here? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't even know what. Literally, I went down to the shop to get a pint of milk. <laughs> well, I was here. I I'm can't. Like, Jed. I can't. I can't get back into New Zealand. It's, um, Mate, they won't let me back. There's no well, he, the, the, Look, he showed up to Bilbo's house unannounced and he stayed for dinner and, Ooh. you know, <laughs> bent the forks. And <laughs> There you go. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was great to sing that song. I, You know, to sing that song live on set was a real, you know, Andy Circus shot a lot of that stuff on the hobbit, a lot of that food fight. And we had a really good time doing it. We, we tried our hardest to wreck that place. <laughs> well, we're about 10 years away from the Hobbit yeah. epic 20th anniversary re reunion. Um, mm -hmm. But so Cliff, take us out. Take us out. Okay, before I take us out, one last question. Jed, have you got any of that dragon gold sitting around that you pitched? 
I still have some <laughs> left. I have, unfortunately, I had to give half of it to Graham McTavish because he demanded it. Um, <laughs> I, I have given away a lot of the fans, but I have kept some of that gold. Yes. Good. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, good. Nori, always pinching things left and right. I love it. You know, um, good on you, mate. As they say in New Zealand, good on you, mate. Good on you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you guys, it's so good to see you. You look really healthy. You look really well. You're doing great. And I'm excited to see both of you. And the sense of camaraderie is infectious. It's really great to have you. So we're going to say goodbye to this edition of Torn Tuesday and to our really wonderful friends, Roy Tolkien and Jed Brophy. Thank you so much again, gentlemen, for being with us. And uh, thank you. Have a fantastic Christmas, you two. Yes. Everyone else is that's going to be watching this live when it eventually comes out. You know, because this is pre-recorded. I don't think we've said it enough. <laughs> it's live. What are you? We're live. We're live. Totally live. Pinch, pinch me. Pinch me. Wake me up. Ikfried ulsur kazar. Ikfried ulsur kazar. Feel the fire of the dwarves. I love it. Hey, and that's it. We're done with the show. That's great. Ladies and gentlemen, until next time, take good care of yourselves and good night and good luck. Or rather, buenos noches y buena suerte. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye.